Welcome, friends. It's almost midnight, and you've found your way to the Pikecast. Come along as we careen through the catalog of the most formative horror writer of our young adult days, Christopher Pike. From adult perspectives, we'll revisit these YA books our parents probably would never have let us read had they known what lie inside. We tackle one book per episode in a freewheeling and unbiased chat. So grab your battered paperback, pull the flashlight from the kitchen drawer, climb under your bed covers, and devour a good book with us. Greetings, fellow pikers, and welcome to the Pike Cast. I'm Cooper Beckett, and I'm thrilled to be joined by my lovely co host. Hi, I'm Cassie. And we'd like to send love to Becca, who is unfortunately under the weather and couldn't join us today. On this episode, we're digging into Christopher Pike's 1989 book, Scavenger Hunt. We're going to be dissecting it in great detail and spoiling each and every plot twist. So consider yourself warned. If you're enjoying the podcast, please leave us a review on the podcast service of your choice. And let's welcome our guest Piker this week, J.J. Ranvier, writer and star of the after disaster broadcast podcast and narrator of the audiobook version of my novel as good as gone welcome hey. jj <laughs> there's the, there's the part i think uh <laughs> cooper's most excited to mention like hey i, I am very we excited did it. we did the audiobook it actually we happened <laughs> it's it's out and part two is about to be recorded I, I mean, I recorded a whole two minutes of, of the next one, <laughs> so <laughs> it is happening. <laughs> but hi, everybody. We're very happy you're here. Thanks. So, JJ, unlike a lot of our guests, you are new to Pike. Yeah, I I hadn't even heard of Christopher Pike until the podcast. <laughs> Because, and because let's put it this way, I was born in 1993. So, four years after this book came out. Yeah. So, I'm a goosebumps kid when it comes to the, you know, the, <laughs> the cheap, uh, pulpy, uh, like literally pulpy, uh, like YA horror book. So, I was like a goosebumps kid. And based on the name, I thought Christopher Pike was like a much more serious author and then i looked it up and i was like wait what oh this is free goosebumps goosebumps (laughs) yeah yeah actually and and pike has his own goosebumps-esque series called spooksville yeah i saw that i i uh i I read up on him a little bit after finishing the book because i I, i'm nosy so (laughs) well so so your first christopher pike book is the utterly bonkers (laughs) scavenger hunt yes (laughs) Oh, because I because when it, you gave me the list of like books to choose from, I went through basically the Goodreads uh, reviews on Pike books to kind of figure out what I would want to read based on the list of what was available from Cooper, um, and everything was like dude's girlfriend died, dude's dude's girlfriend dies, and I was like, mm, I don't I don't know, and then this one was like weird scavenger hunt, and I was like, okay, I'll go with this one, and oh boy. Oh boy, is it weird! <laughs> well, let's let's adapt our guest questions and ask you based on this. <laughs> yes. What do you feel about Christopher Pike without going into detail on the book itself? Well, okay, so I started actually because I, I, you know, I read through the questions you gave me, and I started. Um, kind of as I was going along taking notes and being like, do I think this is a Pike cliche? So I started kind of like trying to, (laughs) based off this book, figure out what the Pike cliches are. My big one is Dead Friends. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So I I figured I got that one. Uh, Dead Friends, horny, (laughs) just horny. (laughs) Uh, Probably my most common note in this book is me underlining something and just writing bonk. (laughs) for going to horny jail um uh uh oh um this one i'm like not as sure on but i was like weird weird way of handling uh disability and kids with disability yep yep okay cool because i was like all these things are pike staples okay yeah i i could i could kind of sense that even from this one which i could tell 
was probably still a bit more off the rails than his other books. Oh yeah. Um, but I was I was definitely like, okay, there's these definitely these staples. Um, oh, uh, oh, I, I guess I I might guess this one is like the t- the town being a major part of like the story, like the, a major character in its own way. He's done that a few times. Yeah. Uh, Actually, this one most feels akin to his book, Whisper of Death, Mm -hmm. which is one of the first ones we read and the one that stuck with me forever. And it's about a girl who is having an abortion. Oh, boy. And dreams, sort of, that she goes back home and there's no one left in town except for a few people. And so it's this like post apocalyptic feel. And it's this oppressive darkness, even in the daylight, that you that you feel oozing all over that book. And I felt that again in Scavenger Hunt. Like when yeah. once they get out into the desert, Ooh. it's just like this this oppressive sense. When when you know? to the plot stuff, I'm definitely like I have some like big thoughts about that one, uh, because that part was probably the scariest part to me. Um uh, and like we can get into that, but basically, uh, what else did I uh, think of? At oh, oh, Catholic shit. There was like mm-hmm. a a uh, last minute some Catholic shit. Like, was he Catholic? Because I was like, wow, I, this is. Really I would very Catholic. Uh, I would be shocked if he wasn't Catholic because yeah. of the way he has approached Catholicism and god in his previous books as well yeah very very sudden god shit um uh yeah i guess those were those would be the big ones that i would i would say were like jumped out at me as like oh these are probably cliches (laughs) Uh, that happen in his books a lot so my question then is do you think you would read more i'm debating it because like i um for context, I have been surviving 2020 and now 2021 by reading a fuck ton. I read 53 books uh, in 2020. <laughs> My New Year's resolution was to read more and stay off social media by reading more. And I started the year off by like reading like one or two books a month. And I was like, wow, this is a really good start. And then I had nothing else to do with myself. Uh, and so it ramped up to like, four to eight books a month. Um, but then this year I've just been having a struggle with like getting into the books again. I started off with like a book that I wasn't super crazy about. Um, but this was like a nice, easy, fun read. So I think I genuinely might because I'm like, like, I don't know. I don't normally like horror books, but I think, um, not that I dislike horror books, but a lot of times I'm like, ooh, this isn't that scary, or the scary parts are just gore, and I'm not huge into gore. But this was, like, a lot of, like, tension in it. And so I'm like, yeah, if I want, like, a nice, easy read, I might actually try another Christopher Bike book for, like, oh, I want to read something. All the other books I have are too heavy or too complicated. You know, that's kind of what I've been thinking. Well, we we would probably steer you in the direction of Whisper of Death, as I said, and Monster, mm. which uh, Monster is about vampires and opens with a massacre at a school party. Oh, boy. <laughs> Just, you know, Monster is great. stuff. <laughs> so, Cassie, uh, do you have the back of the book handy? Mm-hmm. Would you like to give it a read for us? Sure. <clears throat> okay, ready? Yes. The hunt was on. School was almost over. A secretive club on campus had organized a scavenger hunt for the entire senior class. In small groups and with the help of cleverly planted clues, the kids are led throughout the city and then deep into the nighttime desert. The sponsoring club has promised a wonderful prize for the first group to reach the goal of the hunt. But for Carl Timmons, a troubled young man who has recently lost his best friend, the hunt will become a nightmare. Led astray by his love for a strangely beautiful girl, he will wander far from the others and back into a haunted past, where the line between the living and the dead is blurred and broken. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, uh, so we always like to talk about how, um, how accurate the book jacket description and the oh. cover are. 
because oh. pikes, book jackets, uh, the descriptions can vary wildly in accuracy. <laughs> um, so we also have Brian Kotsky's wonderful cover art, and it's so much it. better than the heavy metal cover art from later in the in the series. Yeah, um, I'd say this cover art's pretty pretty accurate, frankly. Yeah, I think um, so too. And then the prey they don't find what they're looking for <laughs> yes. feels very like I was a little like, oh, that's a little over the top. And then like you get to the end and you're like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> well, like those those specific uh little tagline things. Um like if you look at the cover of Osgood books. Oh yeah. I I've taken the tagline style right from Pike. And, <laughs> I cuz I I uh I have the Osgood books like on my bed as like quick reference and then I I had like the Pike book right next to it and I was just like wait a second. <laughs> I'm seeing something here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's a loving tribute. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, the, Cassie, how do you feel the back of the book represents it? Mm, I mean, I think it's it's pretty on point. Like, there's a little, there's a couple of things. Like, they're led throughout the city. Like, two of their clues are in one place. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> um, but like, it's overall, it, it matches way more than like Midnight Club did, for example. So, I'm I'm okay with it. Very um, inaccurate. Yeah. <laughs> I would, if I were you and you're looking for fun reads, um, skip that one and go <laughs> yeah, to, yeah. to what he's saying. And then also like, um, bury me deep. That's a good, like light fun one. And then, um, the immortal, those, you might like those. Those are really good. Ooh, Ooh we okay. got, we still got bury me deep coming up in the next few episodes. I think. I'm so excited. <laughs> I, I don't know. I'm kind of excited that I got the batshit one. Like honestly, because <laughs> I'm like, oh, I kind of just needed to needed some absurdism that isn't the current world right now. <laughs> like, oh, this. But yeah, oh god. <laughs> but, well, yeah. the best thing about that is that as batshit as it seems, it's very Christopher Pike and a lot of his other books. Like reptile people are a theme. Like that's a I that's a point. I wondered about that too. A lot of his books. Yeah. Okay. And it's so great. <laughs> legit, I guess we're getting into plot stuff already. Legit, when we got to that point, I wrote in all caps at the bottom of that page, reptile people? Because <laughs> <laughs> I was like, this is not where I thought this was going. And that for me was when the tension kind of dropped. <laughs> Do you normally like sci-fi or science fiction stuff? I like both. No, I, I've i been reading a lot more fantasy lately because I find lately it's easier to find uplifting and hopeful fantasy because a lot of adult sci-fi is like, in the future, things are going to be worse. And I'm like, right. yeah, I don't need that. <laughs> Um, um he has one it's uh the starlight crystal we haven't done that one yet either um but we're going to within the next couple of months i think and that one's like it's way more sci-fi than horror um and it's also got reptile people in it, so <laughs> I, think, I think you should definitely read that one. <laughs> oh my god okay well and do literally we all i remembered about this book is that there were reptile people yeah it's I, pretty memorable Okay, now it's time to move into our first section, The Midnight Club, where we talk about the characters from Scavenger Hunt. And this one is interesting because, like, I've noticed that almost all of Pike's books feature a slightly put-upon, pining-for-someone main character. Mm -hmm. And this book has two of them. It has two! Oh my, those, oh my god, those chapters when they, like... The first few chapters, I was, like, constantly marking, like, just random lines being like, what the fuck? <laughs> uh, so, okay, speaking of characters, though, I will say I actually did like the characters. Like, for a short book, there was, like, a surprising amount of character development. Like, And not too many, because sometimes yeah. Pike will cram way too many characters into a story. But we're oh. going to start with Carl Timmons. Yes. Who, according to the according to Tracy, had an excellent build and a gorgeous head of blonde yes. hair. Tracy's so horny for him and doesn't want to admit so it, which horny. is where the Catholic shit totally comes in too. Where I was like, I need to read a particular line that I marked okay. because I thought it was hilarious when we got to like Tracy talking about how in love with Carl she is, but like doesn't want to admit it. Uh, but, okay, the the thing I'll say is like basically she's describing how she met him. 
Mm-hmm. And she was like, oh, he helped me with this box. And, it, and he, I didn't think it could be love at first sight. That is illogical. <laughs> and I was but, like, what uh, are you, a Vulcan? <laughs> we, we've noticed um, that not only does Pike have a lot of rather goofy sexuality in these books, oh, so goofy. which is really what made, I, I know I'm speaking for me, but I'm pretty sure Cassie as well, made us want to read him because it was illicit. It was scandalous. Mm-hmm. You know, when we were it was young. horny. It was so horny. Yeah. <laughs> but then lately I'm noticing he also has just these extreme thirsty crushes yes. in his book. So, desperate thirst like so, like like i said i just kept writing bonk because i was like <laughs> you're going to horny jail everyone's going to horny jail like oh my god yeah there's like this one this one's about carl where he's just like describing in depth like kissing sassy who we'll get to and it's just like oh no there was this particular ridiculous line oh two in a row where he's like describing sassy's pool and he's like, uh, <laughs> Sessie's pool. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sessie's pool was like an underground lake, huge, with a black bottom. And maybe a white bottom now, too, if Sessie was still swimming nude. Yeah. Why? 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 I, I also that highlighted that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good. I'm glad it was. I mean, just literally. Me. So, so we, in our, in our section thirst, I usually read like several quotes. Uh, from from the book, and the first page and a half of my quotes yes. are from the skinny dipping stuff yes. in the in the opening of the book. Okay, uh, I'll save my first so quotes because I I have so many. <laughs> yeah, so so in thirst we we have a whole section devoted to thirst. Okay, good. All right, yeah. So yeah, Carl is seems like a very nice young man, but he's thirsty for the the busty lady with the nice eyes. Yes. Which honestly, can you blame him? <laughs> Well, Carl is is a very, very, I mean, but really both Carl and Tracy are very typical Pike heroes. Mm. You know, they are, they're, you know, they're in general, pretty nice people. They mm-hmm. have regrets, they have loss, and they have desperate yearning. So much yearning. And. I mean, I found I found both Carl and Tracy to be really nice primary characters, and I thought the uh, the division of them, only to have their their paths crossing over and over, was a really nice move on his part. I did, yeah. I actually liked both of them a surprising amount because I was like, I didn't have high expectations for a. Uh, a female character written in the eighties, and I was like, oh. Like, Tracy is a surprisingly well-developed... Like, I, th- I totally expected it to be, like, Tracy is horny for Carl, and that's the her character. But, like, I don't know. She's, she's seemed pretty, like, cool and, like, with it, but, like, compassionate. I don't know. I liked Tracy. She's, like, very brave. Like, at one point, you know, she dives into the, the purple house and, yeah. it, and, like, keeps going even though the flashlight is broke. Like, that... Oh, like we'll get into it, but that part was so fucking. She scary. actually, uh, she she comes off as a better protagonist than Carl overall. I thought that too. Agreed. Yeah, yeah, I, I liked like, her way better than Carl. I was like, oh, if Carl dies, but Tracy lives, I'm happy. <laughs> well, yeah, and Carl is sort of inert as a character. Mm-hmm. You know, his defining trait is the loss of his friend, and thus his inability to do anything really except lust after Sessie. Yeah. Well, I also, for Carl, I found very interesting because I joke around a lot about how PTSD in books, movies, TV often is portrayed as either A, you get over it in like five minutes or by the end of the episode or by the end of the page, or you have been sad about this for 15 fucking years and you're never going to get over it. Mm -hmm. It seems like there's no in between. But like a year after your friend died, like very suddenly, very tragically in front of you. Like, I found that very, like, I found it to be, like, surprisingly believable PTSD. Yeah. Specifically in an era where they aren't sending people to therapy, so. Very true. And uh, 
in in a town that's very small, they're also not sending people to therapy. That, nope. That, there's that. Nope. Yeah, we can get into it later, but like I'm from yeah. Southern California, so like a lot of that stuff was also really interesting for me. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I don't know. Carl was like an like an okay protagonist. Like I liked him better than I thought I would like him, but I liked Tracy a lot more. <laughs> Well, there's really, uh, you know, one of the one of the things we encounter over and over is iffy protagonists, like protagonists that make us slightly uncomfortable in mm. Pike's uh, work because well, of the time that. period, <laughs> um, because of uh, just problematic n- nature in in the storytelling. Mm-hmm. But these two are really like solid, yeah, and. And it actually made me wonder why of all the books that Pike has sequelized, he never sequelized this. I mean, I I can see it, though, like reading it, it's a very complete story in a way. Like, yes, there's a little bit of like, ooh, is Ceci going to come? Like, if he was going to do a sequel, it would be about Ceci coming back. Yes, it wouldn't be I about- want it. Yeah. Sorry, I, I'm really into that idea. I really want, I, <laughs> yeah. I want she, that book. She literally threatens it. She's like, at the very end, she's like, I'm going to come back and you're not going to know. But yeah. like, I'm very, in, I'd be much more into the idea of Ceci coming back and like, sure, like, and maybe she finds like Carl and uh, Tracy later, but it's about her and her like this, like being this like anti-hero character. Yeah. So. Without the guy too now. Yeah, without without Davy. Without Davy. Um, so okay. I do want to I do want to call out uh, Tracy's <laughs> pretty standard uh, Pike thing, but she's she, okay. So she uh, Carl thinks she's a good kid. Which oh is my god! Obnoxious. It's so uh, weird. Like that one, I kept marking because I was like, this. Th- that was the most clear part where I was like, this was written by an adult. <laughs> right. I have never met an eighteen-year-old boy i wouldn't necessarily call him a man at this point boy who who calls other people his age kid yeah and and it's not like like if she was a year younger than him i could sort of see it but But they were both freshmen when when he had a crush on her yeah they're they're the same they're the same damn age so it was like it was like christopher pike have you have you talked to your fellow teens? <laughs> like, it's, it's... Well, Tracy has a pretty delicate face with well-defined cheekbones and a proud chin. Like most redheads, she was fair. And if the summer sun didn't make her burn, it usually gave her another dozen cute freckles. Her only problem was that she could not gain weight. She had too much energy and burned too many calories. It didn't matter what she ate. When she turned sideways, her shadow disappeared. The shadow disappearing thing was like, wow. And it also, like, this also felt like there's so many things in the book that I was very like, wow, this is like a a weird tell of the 80s that, like, Carl totally goes for the thicker, curvier girl. And Mm -hmm. and not the the skinny chick who had a problem gaining weight, which I'm like, wow. (laughs) <laughs> it, that is that is a different time there mm-hmm. yeah but what what is really interesting and i'm i'm wondering what you noticed about this cassie is tracy doesn't have any of pike's traditional hero imperfections she i mean i don't i think that's because he didn't he doesn't intend for her to be the hero. And so because of that, she, she's also not like super sassy in the same way that a lot of his other right. leads for the girls are um, like, not as, I don't know, rough around the edges. Like she's so nice and she just seems so nice. Like that's like the well, main thing about her. We get the rough her. around the edges with Paula. Yeah. Yeah. And that's <laughs> yes. the thing. Like, and so it's, it was almost like he divided his normal main girl into two different people. And yeah. Normally, when I feel like he splits characters that he could have combined, I don't like it. But I did like this, and I didn't feel there were too many. Like I felt like they each had their own role. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Because okay, like since I brought up Paula, can I read the pa- like the Paula paragraph? Yeah. Because let's talk about it, Paula then. Paula is, was dating, uh, you know, uh, Joe Carl's Travers. yeah, Carl's now dead friend. Um, okay, so. <laughs> Paula had been waiting in the gym the whole time. Tracy found her and Rick at the bottom bleacher. Uh, Paula only needed one more week and she would have her diploma. 
Yet she was risking expulsion by smoking a cigarette in full view of half the faculty. Paula had gone wild since she had lost her boyfriend. Uh-huh. Uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, I can I can follow that up with yeah. the description here. She used to have long, wavy blonde hair, but recently had cut it short. She either wore gobs of purple eyeshadow and tons Ooh. of cheap jewelry with pink Ooh. halter tops, or else wore no makeup and a torn Levi jacket. She chain smoked and stank of smoke. Her favorite word was goddamn. Oh, and even the follow after that, the pattern was not complex. Paula had lost her love, and now she was angry at the world. <laughs> And it was just like, oh my god, she lost her boyfriend and now she's a biker girl. <laughs> like, well, and, and not only is she a biker girl, but he goes out of his way to describe how there really are no bikers in their yeah. town. <laughs> I, I just found that whole, like, and we're skipping around. It, that was like a whole page. Like, they had a whole page yeah. description on what a bad girl Paula is now. It really wouldn't be complete. If we didn't uh, mention another character who we never meet, Paula's boyfriend, I guess. Yeah. Harv? The, she gives all her, her money to him. I was like, girl. I, like, she was like, I give all my money to him and he lets me ride on the back of her, his motorcycle. And I'm like, girl, go buy your own motorcycle. <laughs> I think, no, she was. That was just a lie. She was paying for her brother's hospital bills. Oh, was she? Oh, wait, really? Yeah, they, they oh, just like immediately up. after that they were like, "Oh, the insurance." Like she talked about how her parents stopped oh, right. paying the premium yes. on their insurance, oh. so all of her money. That's why she was working full time while going to school was to for her brother. Which actually oh. brings us another Pikeism in a searing indictment of the healthcare industry. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which was also like, oh no, things have not gotten better since the eighties. Yeah, yeah. Oh. yeah. They yeah. only give health insurance to healthy people, according I, to Paula. Yeah, I highlighted mm -hmm. that because that was like one of the few lines that I highlighted because I was like, oh, that's very applicable to today. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. it is. And this book is over thirty years old. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so. thirty-two actually. Yeah. Uh, I want to. I want to read read Harv's description though because it's fun. He was one of the few guys in the gang who had a motorcycle. He had a great body and leather boots and a personality that had as much going for it as a piece of stale salami. That was one of my favorite lines. Like, if we were going to pull out lines that we liked, I was like, that was amazing. <laughs> Just... well, yeah, every once in a while, you really get this sense that Pike uh, wishes he was writing 1940s noir. <laughs> And yeah. that that's one of those lines that feels akin to that, I think. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. And there's like, yeah, there's a couple. Of, it was so funny, too, because sometimes the writing quality just like swung back and forth wildly where it'd be like this, that great description. But then like, you know, five pages later, Carl calls Tracy a kid and it's like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's the paradox of Christopher Pike. Is there is there is lyrical beauty in a lot of his work, but there's also just these huge growth. I mean, it's the same as any other author, I suppose. Like Stephen mm -hmm. King, you can you can pick out the gloner groaners and the thirsty sections, and also <laughs> the most poetic things you've ever read. Mm -hmm. But uh, it it's really funny how wildly he can swing in a single book. Yeah, and even in like a single page, I feel like sometimes where I'd be like, wow, that was a great line. And then two lines later, I'm like, that was unnecessarily horny. Yep. <laughs> so... Speaking of unnecessarily horny, <laughs> let's talk about Sessie oh, Stepford. I love and... Stepford, too. I was like, Stepford Wives you... was out by then, right? Oh, Stepford Wives was the, the 60s, I think. Okay, yeah, cuz I was like that that was on purpose. Oh yeah, you don't you don't name someone Stepford unless there's something wrong uh, weird or wrong about them. Mm -hmm. 1972 it was out. Mm. Um so Ceci is is our our traditional Christopher Pike um hot girl. Hot girl but hot probably evil girl. Oh, he he returns to that well a lot, oh. um, and and Ceci's got long 
black hair, long curly black hair. Mm-hmm. I have I have the paragraph description from Carl's point of view, of course. Mm-hmm. Sessy grinned, showing her dimples. Her face was round, too cute to be called classically beautiful, and too sensual to be thought of as innocent. Her lush lips were the first thing a guy noticed about her, if not her wonderful hair. In fantasies, whenever Carl kissed her, he always felt as if he were being eaten alive by those full lips. She swallowed the remains of her sausage (laughs) and batted her thick black lashes over her dark blue eyes. She was such a tease. God, Jesus Christ. (laughs) Carl wishes he were that sausage. Almost, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Almost like all my like horny jail bonks are like just Carl thinking about Sassy. Yeah, lusting <laughs> like, after Sassy. Really, that's the, that that's is it. the sexy in this book. Really, yeah. that that's all of it is him desperately lusting for Sassy. I mean, the way he describes her, I don't know. Me too. <laughs> Eat me, lizard <laughs> yeah. <crazy> lady. <laughs> And she she has an interesting arc here because you know we we know she and Davy are the the same. They're part of this ancient something the terrible lizards. Yeah, and they they sort of exist outside of time and space, and we get a cosmic horror thing going on in there too. Mm-hmm. But then we also get Ceci talking about how she's known by many names. And even Davy doesn't understand who she is, and he needs to remember who she is. Mm-hmm. But we never get that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's so many. With Ceci and Davy, I felt the most incomplete with the book mm. because I was sort of like, I kind of wanted like a little bit more explanation of like what the fuck their deal was. Because right. he kept kind of do, like I, I could see him going for it being kind of vague, but like sort of like, oh, like being really mysterious. And they're, you know, they're from the age of the dinosaurs. But it's sort of like, OK, then what are they like? The main thing also, I was like, how do they look like humans? Like, is that like a mirage thing? Is right. that a... It, like, did they steal a human skin? Like, they just didn't explain that part. And I'm like, hmm, okay. Yeah, there is there is a whole lot, you know, for all the monologuing that happens. Yes, so much more. There is so little that's actually explained. Mm-hmm. And the the complexity of the ultimate plan is so Convoluted. off the wall. Yeah. And, and I mean, we, we obviously will talk a whole lot more about that in the plot section, mm-hmm. but it's what, what I found interesting is when the, the true nature of Davy and Ceci is revealed, Ceci sort of turns into Drusilla from Buffy. Oh, that's a perfect comparison. Like she starts obsessing about the dog and wants to hear more about this God and, you know, in. She she's wandering around. I'm bored. I'm having fun. Are you having fun? While while Davy is just stomping around, being like, "Look at me! Look how badass I am!" Mm-hmm. I'm a big scary man. Yeah. So it it was a really interesting dynamic there, especially since Ceci seemed like the dominant. If if I mean we we I assumed they were going to be the villains. Did it, everybody else? Oh yeah. Well, I I got I didn't like Davy from the get go, so I was very like, oh, I don't I don't trust this fucker at all. So I, was I, like, I don't like anyone named Davy. <laughs> I honestly I kept picturing him as the lead singer of that band. Do you know? No. He, uh, oh, I can't I, remember. All, the band. All I, I got Google is Davy and Goliath. I googled David or Davy lead singer, and that's how I found it. Hang on, Davy <laughs> lead singer. That was what I. Yeah, I will say for Ceci. Davy Havoc. Point- that's who it is. Who is it? Who? From AFI. Oh, yeah. Oh. Yeah, so that's why I know what he looks like because I've seen him in music videos. I apparently just didn't know what the band was. But that's what <laughs> I pictured the whole time. So, like, with, like, a lot of eyeliner and, like, dressed, like, all super, like, emo gothy, you know, and just, like, very angsty and, like, oh, I'm so cool. Look at me, you know? And so yeah. I hated him immediately. I did not like him. <laughs> well, they said he was senior class president, and that's when I was like, I don't like him. <laughs> yes, there is there is that, too. I was like, oh, uh, he's a popular kid? Mm-mm. <laughs> no, thank you. But then Davey they said he had... didn't know why. Like, 
they don't nobody believed him or anything it's just he's like charming because he's like bewitching them which once again do not like <laughs> that yeah kind no of guy. thank mm-hmm. you davy is toxic masculinity in this book yeah oh yeah uh he, he had his sister's great looks big dark blue eyes and a wide full-lipped mouth curly black hair but Sissy says he's a liar. I should tell you that about him. But then it runs in the family. And it's like, okay, you're hanging a lampshade on the fact that you're the villain. We we get it. Yeah. We see it. We just don't know how yet. Oh, yeah. Well, though, okay. We're getting into the Davy. I will. I do want to say one quick thing about Sissy. Because, like, she has this interesting arc where she's, like, this really fun girl, clearly hot, knows she's hot. And then it starts to turn and get a little weird once they get out into the desert. And I ended up writing this note because uh, uh, at one point there's a line. He couldn't understand it. She had the endurance of an Olympic athlete and the personality of a woodland sprite. And I wrote down Manny, uh, Manic Pixie Dream Slut. <laughs> but really, she's actually more like Manic Pixie Nightmare Slut. Yeah. <laughs> All things considered. She, so. she's, the, she's the bewitching character who's ultimately going to kill you. Yeah. Which then, is a pikeism. I believe it. This dude definitely has some hangups and, and definitely watches <laughs> Dom porn. Definitely. <laughs> like <laughs> reading this, I was like, oh dude, you have a type. They're both in this book. <laughs> um Oh yes. But oh, yeah, yeah. Davy. Davy's a creepy motherfucker, and I didn't like him the instant he came on the scene. He's He's one of those characters that doesn't feel at all like a high schooler. Mm. You know, he'd be played get... by like some 30 year old and you'd be like, yes. yeah, all exactly. right, I guess. It's like, so you're a teacher, right? Oh, no, no, you're, you're in, you're part of our class. Huh? Okay. And, but it's... nobody thinks it's weird. <laughs> yeah. He's. There was never a doubt in my mind that he was evil. And uh, the the dynamic between him and Sessie is very interesting once we get to the church. Mm-hmm. And I really like that we have two, we basically have the protagonist of a typical Pike book split in two and the antagonist of a typical Pike book split in two. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it, it creates a very unique dynamic in this book that I think elevated the book tremendously. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I definitely found like as someone who's who read a lot of YA as a kid and often authors writing YA don't seem to understand that like young adults actually can have complex feelings and complex thoughts and sure. they often are very one dimensional. I was totally going in being like expecting very one dimensional characters, but I definitely thought that like the characters were like for a short book cuz when you're in a short book, you can only do so much character development. Right. But I found them to be like decently developed. Yeah, me too. Uh, like it's it's interesting. And the most interesting developing I think is Rick. I love Oh, sorry, I broke on there. I <laughs> love Rick. I love Rick so much. He's the best character. Yeah. So many of my favorite things were just him saying snarky shit. I love and Rick. And honestly, he's uh he's the character from um Dream Warriors. The the kid in the wheelchair in Dream Warriors. Yeah, yeah, um, he is. He definitely is. I, I can't think of the, is his name, but it's like in, in in my dreams, I'm the wizard master. He's yeah. that guy. <laughs> And that's awesome. And I I I totally dig that. And it is interesting. You know, we've talked a lot about Pike's um, sort of ham-fisted representation. Uh, Like he does that a lot with um, Eastern religion and he does that with uh, illness. Like multiple characters in these books have had AIDS. And he... He basically is trying to normalize things, Mm -hmm. I think. And sometimes it works better than others. Rick, I think, works pretty well, except for the problematic part of continually calling him cripple. Yes. Or or there there was like a couple of times where like he he had like a a, an issue. Like he like there was the one scene where he starts like 
having trouble breathing. And they mm-hmm. straight up are like, oh, poor Rick. He's so weak. And I'm like, this dude, like, wheels himself around town. Like, yeah. uh, but at, like, one point, they're, they're, like, it's very... I was worried that it would keep going, but it was only a couple times. But they, they were very pitying of him, which, you know, able-bodied people definitely do that. But, like, he would also, he clearly internalized that a little bit. Like, there was one time where he was like, oh, maybe my disability is affecting my mind. And I'm like, I, I, don't they just keep saying how smart you are? Like, what the fuck? <laughs> yeah. And it, it seemed like it might have been snarky, but, it, like, it also seemed possibly, like, you know, when people say snarky, def- self-deprecating things, but they actually yeah. mean it. So, yeah. but, yeah. Well, but he, he's still the best character, in my no, opinion. He's, he's fully formed. He's very, He's got a lot of agency. Mm-hmm. And that's what makes him so interesting. Like in in another book, Paula would be the dominant character of the two of them, but Paula almost fades into the background, yeah, because of her brother Rick's personality. Mm-hmm. You know, and he's along for this wacky ride, and everybody regards him as the smartest person on the trip. Yeah, and and not in a oh you're you're so like like they genuinely are like oh yeah Rick yeah not patronizing really at all yeah. Um, but yeah, I like, uh, there's this one particular exchange that I was like, okay, this is, this is officially where I become a Rick Stan where I'm like, this is my, (laughs) he is my easily my favorite. Oh yeah. Okay. So like Davey's like, oh, that's true. But I speak before you and I'll probably go over a quarter of an hour. In that case, Rick said, I'll change my topic to the problem of noise pollution. (laughs) amazing what a smackdown and it was to davy too which also made me happy because fuck davy <laughs> yes indeed fuck davy so i don't know let's move on to tom barrett who is not a real character nope <laughs> and that's okay because he's not a real person yeah and he's, I mean, he's a plot device. He's not a character. Yeah. But what's really interesting about the way they play this plot device is I really like the idea that nobody can remember specifics about him, mm-hmm. only that he was always there. Yeah. And that is a, that is one of the most intensely creepy ways for someone to be evil, as far as I can, can know, is to actually manipulate your memory. Yeah. I don't know and about you. insert something. You too. But, like, me- people, like, memory stuff, like, creeps me out a lot. Like, I have a, a fear of losing my memory, losing my ability to remember things. And so the Tom stuff totally creeped me out as it got like ramped up because they give you like a a pretty decent explanation oh he had like a head injury which also compared to rick the way they treat him because they think he has a head injury is almost worse (laughs) because they're just like oh well he's this creepy dude who can't like make his face like emote right what a weirdo and i'm like that that feels rude and they like keep bringing it up because it's his only trait is that he's very like flat and emotionless and i'm like this this is like not a good way to portray people with a head injury so i was glad that it wasn't that but i was like that's still i didn't like that (laughs) when and you get tom being carl's best friend despite the fact that they don't really interact at all Mm mm-hmm um and i mean obviously the the elephant in the room is that tom is actually Joe. Dun, dun, dun. But, and here's where I got confused. Mr. Partridge yes. is also Joe. That was so baffling to me. Because I was like, wait. So, is it that Tom is Joe in a different body, but they stole Joe's body? Like, Mr. Partridge just didn't need to be there. Like that was kind of the no, thing. but he is fascinating. Yeah, like I, it's it's funny because I created a character that reminds me so much of this character, and it must have been just seeped into my memory of this book. <laughs> mm-hmm. Um, like the just he, like he's dressed like he's on safari. He's wearing these uh these 
mirror sunglasses and a hat. Like he's he clearly there's something wrong with him, and there's yeah. something wrong with a school that lets this guy put mm-hmm. on a scavenger hunt. Yeah. And I send think- its students off to whatever. Well, the thing that creeped me out too is the um the fact that his clothes were all gray. Because yeah. speaking of goosebumps, there is a uh pretty well known goosebumps where there's this camera that sends you into like a black and white version of the school that you can't escape. And I knew it wasn't going in that direction, but it reminded me of that. And so when she like gets into the 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 creepy purple house and there's like the picture of him in the like gray clothes, I was just like, oh, like it just like reminded me of that Goosebumps book and like sent a sh- sent a shudder down my spine. Wait, but uh, so I'm I'm just confused about Mr. Partridge because then Davy says that he's his alter ego and that house in the desert was his, but it was also Davy's house because that's where he's mm-hmm. collecting all of the evidence of his murders. So who, what, what did he exist as a man at some point and Davy just killed him and took so. him over? It's Who's so, buried? It's real, that's like one of the most confusing parts of the book because I'm with you, Cassie, on that one. I was there, like they reveal that, like, oh, it's it's Joe, it's his skeleton, and they just put skin on him and put, used him as a puppet but then they're later like tom is joe and i was like did what so well they do yeah and then they do say that he looks different so to imply i guess that that's a different body given to him now but why why, why did did you had his bones why didn't you make him into that instead of i know body? right why not yeah. make joe give joe back joe yeah that's so it was weird it was, yeah that yeah that was probably the biggest kind of plot hole for me in this like there was stuff that i wish had more explanation but there was enough explanation but that one it seemed like look creepy thing you dug up joe's body haha but it's mr partridge and then it was like haha actually it's also creepy (laughs) because it's tom and i was like so it made the tom reveal which i also kind of saw coming at once once he put on the wet sock was when i started to be like he drowned tom like Joe right, drowned right, in a Tom, river. Yeah. Um, so that's when I started kind of picking it up. I mean, the gold chain, of course, was like the really, the big tell. Um, but yeah, I, I was with you, Cassie, on that one where I was just like, I don't, I don't get what they're going for here. And it kind of takes the scariness out of the reveal. It's well, why so don't strange. we do this? Let's, uh, let's take our commercial break and come back and get into the plot. Uh, and where we can really dig into this stuff. So we will be right back with more of the Pipecast. Wow, friends, where else can you get this kind of programming than the Pipecast? Nowhere, that's where. But we're trying to keep the lights on here. If you like what you're hearing and want it to keep happening, jump over to our Patreon at thepikecast.com slash Patreon and throw us a few bucks to join our private Discord server. Higher tiers get books, stickers, bookmarks, and even personalized shirts. That's thepikecast.com slash Patreon. Once, Osgood and Frost were the up-and-coming stars of the burgeoning paranormal investigation TV show craze before a hoax put an end to their friendship, partnership, and television careers. Now, over a decade later, Prudence Osgood is a barely functioning alcoholic ghost hunter for hire, Her yearning for mystery and adventure is reignited when she receives a cryptic, untraceable email. She can't resist embarking on an investigation that tugs threads, winding through a sinister series of disappearances, her former partner's family, and a night 20 years ago when a semi blew a yellow light and nearly killed her. Reviewers are calling As Good As Gone a masterfully vulnerable and relatable 21st century horror story and a bourbon-soaked supernatural mystery with sparkling dialogue that sticks the landing on LGBT characters and main character Prudence Osgood, as tortured as she is clever, broken in all the best ways, and a true heroine for our times. 
Buy it today at As Good As Gone as a paperback, ebook, or audiobook narrated by me, JJ Ronvier. Welcome back to the Pike Cast. Now we move into our section, Remember Me, where we talk about the plot. And there is a lot of it in oh, this boy. book. Pike's locations are really starting to interest me because he doesn't stay in one location. You know, a lot of uh, writers write their area. Like Cough, I, Stephen I King, said everything Cough, in Stephen Chicago. King. <laughs> Stephen King writes everything in Maine, although he doesn't. He writes a lot of things outside of Maine, but most things in Maine. Most things um, about a writer in Maine. Yeah, specifically. well, that's true. But this, it takes place in Express. Oh, what state is it in? Is it Southern California? Yeah, it is. So yeah, it can, is. I, can I talk, like, so I'm from Southern yeah. California. I'm originally from L.A., but I uh, lived in the mountains near L.A. for five years. Um, and I think the area that he's talking about reminds me a lot of the Inland Empire. The, he says it's, like, outside of San Diego, but, like, the way he describes it sounds very Inland Empire. And yes, there is a uh, David Lynch movie called Inland Empire that there does is. not take place in Inland Empire whatsoever. Um, <laughs> but the main thing that I found interesting is at one point he references directly Joshua trees, which do either of you know what a Joshua tree is? It's, it's yeah, the I one live in California. <laughs> oh, okay. arms bent, right? It's a cactus. Oh, Okay. Yeah, it, sure. it's, it's not really a tree. <laughs> it's a cactus. Okay. Um, and so that made me go, oh, wow, I can picture this place perfectly, like absolutely perfectly in my mind. But yeah, the the dryness, the hotness of it um, is very interesting as like he doesn't bring it up too much. But I thought that was very uh, interesting factors. And then the flooding of the desert thing, I went, What? <laughs> So speaking of plot. <laughs> well, as, as far as I have read, and I don't live anywhere near the desert and I never have, when in the rare occasions the desert gets storms, flooding and flash floods like that are very common and very dangerous. Yeah. That... Yeah. If you're camping out there, you can just like die and not have any warning at all. Like it's, it's, it's pretty sad. Yeah. Flash floods when I particularly when I lived on the mountain were kind of scary because like sure. everything floods down the mountain. And so mm -hmm. like, and the mountain was in the desert, like it was a, a desert mountain. Um, and <laughs> yeah, so that, but that's still that part. Like I, like I've gone walking around the desert, hiking around the desert and I've never had a problem with rain. So that part immediately I went, there's something weird going on here. <laughs> like that, that was my first th thing immediately that I was like, Hmm. Something weird with his friend's death. And this is a, you know, supernatural book. So, of course, there's something weird with his friend's death. I also, uh, I found it interesting. They talk about how the temperature is 111, I think. Yeah. Yeah, the high temperature really confused me, too. Because I know, I mean, I feel you like you can't go outside at that, that hot, temperature. Like, yeah. <laughs> Even in dry doing, heat. like, a scavenger hunt. You're like, certainly like not doing a scavenger hunt them. where you're climbing a mountain. Right. Yeah. It's wild. And, you know, I've, I, I've only been in that kind of temperature once, and it was when I was in Baker, um, which has the world's largest thermometer, which celebrates the hottest temperature on record of 122 Ooh. in California. Ooh. And I was there when it was 111. And getting out of my car, like, it, it's, it's like you're wearing oppressive garments. Mm -hmm. It's, it's hard to breathe. Like, you're... You stay home. Yeah, you, you don't, don't go out. No. Yeah, and like stay think, in air conditioning the whole time. Don't drive around in the back of a pickup car. truck. Yeah, because like I, I can take ninety degree dry heat like pretty much no problem. But I, I am flat on my ass. Uh, seventy degree humid heat because oh, I grew yeah. up oh, in yeah. the desert. Like I can't fucking stand humidity. But past ninety. It doesn't matter. It's miserable. Like, it's fucking awful. <laughs> so. so Pike has a problem with extreme temperatures. <laughs> because what was the temperature in Slumber Party? I, I remember it being, it wasn't. It, it was wasn't, like negative it was, 10, was not believable. Think, right? Yeah. Yeah. But and it was, it was, it was a negative 10, a blizzard. And 
this the the uh, the lead girl was thirsty for sex outside in the snow. In what? the snow. No. Yeah. What? No. Yeah. Bitch, yeah. you're gonna die. I mean, they didn't do it, thankfully. Oh, but okay. It wasn't her choice, though. It was because the guy wasn't into it. (laughs) And she even thought, she's like, oh, maybe he's just, like, not into me. Or I guess, like, he doesn't only have one thing on his mind. The thing on his mind is the weather, girl. It is in the (laughs) negative. (laughs) Like, what the fuck? What the fuck? Sorry, I have all the ridiculous things. (laughs) He likes to show extreme temperatures, but doesn't actually know what those temperatures should be because it would be just as oppressive at 95 degrees Mm -hmm. in the desert. And it would be just as oppressive at 10 degrees in, in the winter. Yeah. And more believable. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, And you would would die hiking a mountain at like 111 degrees. I know. Right. Especially with Ceci drinking all the water and pouring it all over her boobs. Yeah. Oh my God. That part. That must have been so refreshing, though. I was thinking about that. And I was like, man, it's so hot there. Like, that must feel amazing for her. Good girl. Yeah. (laughs) But also, like, they established that they're lizard people. So it's sort of like they probably like the heat. You don't need the water. (laughs) And they say, too, why they're so, like, cold to the touch and stuff. So that's what I thought that was interesting, too, that they are reptilian. Mm -hmm. But they're, like, in a desert. So it's like they wouldn't be anymore. (laughs) They they would be warm. So... Once again, one of the things I did want to know, didn't need it, but I did want to know, like, were they in human bodies or were they fooling everyone with illusions that they looked human? That was never yeah. established and it bothered me. I mean, me. It, if we could understand their powers, I think we'd understand, understand it more. They didn't understand their powers. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, they don't. But, like, so, so truly, are they dinosaurs that evolved into humanoid or are they a race that survived with the dinosaurs? Mm-hmm. Or are they star children from other dimensions, which is implied yeah. when uh, Carl sticks his head in the void? Mm-hmm. I think they're pre-dinosaurs, too, because they said they came before everything and that they had, like, all this technology and, like, stuff oh, like yeah. that before they got wiped out. And then she watched the extinction of all of her people when she was very young. Um So it makes sense that they wouldn't really know as much about themselves or as about, because if you're like a 14 year old, I mean, just trying to compare it to like humans, but if you're a 14 year old girl and you see everything around you die, you wouldn't really know Mm -hmm. a lot of stuff. So I thought that was interesting too. And that's again, why I want a sassy book. Like I really, I want to write a book about her. I want to read about it. Yeah. We should directly ask him on Twitter for it. We should. (laughs) We should be like, who? Tweet at Christopher Pike. (laughs) We we have been doing that actually. <laughs> we need we need more sassy and more fat Freddy. I'm here for these two. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! So let's talk about this scavenger hunt because the first the like five clues are obnoxiously simple, mm-hmm. and nobody gets them, and they make it seem like it's the biggest deal in the world that Rick was able to solve this. Yes, it's so the one that got me was the Star Wars one because it was like. <laughs> They were like, oh, I don't, I don't know what this is from. Like, Tracy's like, I don't know uh, th- this quote. And Paula's like, I don't know either. Thankfully, Tracy's the one to get it. But to me, I was very like, oh, come on. Girls know Star Wars. Are you kidding me? Then, like, it was one of the biggest movies of all time. Like, come on. Paula throws the divisive, oh, that Muppet from Star Wars. That part I got that me. I funny. laughed. I like yeah. that one. <laughs> I like cackled reading it. I was like, that Muppet from Star Wars. Yeah, just that, like so dismissive. Oh, yeah. Yoda, that Muppet? Yeah. <laughs> she downgraded 30 Yoda years so later. <laughs> so uh, my big one is, and, and it may just be the time, because they didn't have the internet. Yeah. And they didn't have, but uh, I could have been a contender. Is like, here's looking at you, kid. It's, yeah. It's well, a famous movie line. I, I so didn't know that. I will fully, okay. no, yeah, I I will fully admit, one. I thought it was from Rocky. And I think I that did was too. Be- yeah. Okay, I'm glad it wasn't just me. Because no. I because like the gold chain, and I could have been a contender. I was like, oh, it's mm, Rocky. Okay. And there was even a joke about, does it ring a bell? And I was like, oh, it's got to be Rocky. And then it was not. And I was like, it was not oh. Rocky. 
Yeah, no, I was like, when is Rocky going to get mentioned? And then they mentioned that other thing that I honestly, I genuinely do not even remember it now because I was it's like on I didn't the know waterfront. What it was. It's it was a Marlon on the Brando waterfront. Movie. It's a it's a it's a it's know. a Marlon Brando movie. Yeah, yeah, and no. it's Over it is head. about. I mean, he he talks about he could have been a contender, but here's the problem I have with this one. First of all, Carl went on a date to see this, <laughs> and is able to quote. Four lines from it. Wait, yes. I don't, did they go on a date to see it, or because I was that because I thought they said that they both ended up seeing a movie like at the same time, and afterward when they realized they were both there for the movie, they saw each other and then they went out for ice cream. Oh, that yeah, that could that be okay. Been. So I, I don't think it was a date necessarily, but I I I'm here with you for the rest. But he knows enough about this movie to say these lines, kid. This ain't your night. We're going for the price on Wilson. Uh. Yeah, this ain't your night. My night? I could have taken Wilson apart. I could have had class. I could have been a contender. Yeah, it's more than four lines. He quotes like five. Yeah. How did he not get that immediately? Yeah. Uh, Exactly. If, if If you know that much of the movie, you get it immediately. But here's another problem. Rick is displeased and says, I think it's a disgrace Mr. Partridge chose a movie from another era. Right? I thought that was so, hilarious because I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> well, I did a little research. On the Waterfront came out 35 years before this book, which is currently 32 years old. Okay. <laughs> okay. But it's like they went to see it in theaters. Yeah. So yeah. It's well, also- and, and honestly, though, 32 years old, that's like me saying it's a disgrace to talk about Ghostbusters 2 because mm-hmm. it came out in a different era. Yeah. Well, I think, though, so stupid. At, nowadays, we have so much more. Well, one, we have a lot of 80s nostalgia. Holy shit. That's true. Too That's much. True. Um, but, like, I think now we it's so much more because of the internet, because of the access of information that we, like, kind of accept, like, oh, yeah, like, we all know movies from different eras. We all know movies yeah. that we haven't even seen because of memes, because of people quoting them, because of, like, you know, there's so much pop culture now because we have decades and decades of pop culture that like it's, you know, it seeps in. But like, look at the fact that both me and Cassie thought it was Rocky. So, oh, I mean, OK, I, 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 I will concede that it is not ridiculous that uh, uh, oh, these I, kids wouldn't know it. I I, yeah, I don't think it's ridiculous that they wouldn't. Well, I think it's ridiculous that Carl didn't know it because <laughs> yeah, yeah. I have movies that I absolutely and, love. And I can't you know quote what? you five lines in a row with, from them. <laughs> like, with as in love as, with Carl as Tracy is, she would remember that night. Yeah. She would remember that movie. Yeah. But I am with Rick on you, like, you really picked a movie, like, unnecessarily, too, because, like, it didn't end up having to do with any of the rest of the plot either. Right. Like, so I'm like, no, I've got it with Rick on that one. But a disgrace is harsh. <laughs> a, a disappointment, not great idea, but a disgrace. But can we talk about the further disgrace of setting two scavenger hunt items yes. in the that same was really video dumb. store? That was so dumb. And that was all, though that one was absolutely a plot thing because they wanted the incest thing to get in there. And they were like, well, yeah. we need to keep them near the ice cream shop so that way Tracy can see. The, also I feel like we could incest. have done that differently. <laughs> yes. Also, can we talk about sudden incest in the book? Yes, yeah, suddenly what? incest. We, we haven't gotten that in a Pike book before, suddenly I, incest. Yeah. And it was like, jarring because i was like oh these two are really weird and like i thought later they were going to address that like oh actually they're not brother and sister they're actually like a married couple and they're but then she keeps calling him brother throughout the book yeah so i'm like i think so yeah. I think for, with that was just because of their they're the same like they're the last two of like their species. So I think the brother thing was from that because then they also play it as like wife and husband like in the right. past. So I think that they are just the last two. So they're like mated together because then she says, why did you take me as your lover or something like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's it's creepy, dude. But like also I kind of got cruel intentions vibe from it a little bit. And Mm -hmm. so I was like, I was kind of here. I wasn't I don't want to say I was here for it because that puts it makes it sound wrong. But I was like here for it in the way that I was like, ooh, cruel intentions. Here we go. And then it it didn't we didn't go. It didn't. Let's, Let's be the very controversial podcast that actually admits that there is something alluring 
about that type of plot point and cruel intentions pointed it out. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I was mad that they didn't fuck in cruel intentions. I'll just say it. Because they built it all up and then they, they didn't did. fuck. And I was like, yeah. I'm mad. <laughs> you yeah, made me no, for I, I was nothing. like yeah i was like where's the payoff for this like and i know i'm not supposed to want the payoff at the same time but the yeah, actors are both attractive people so exactly, you're watching you're exactly. like, get it on yeah so i'm yeah. like no 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 it's not that you wanted incest it's that you wanted to see sarah michelle geller make out with this very hot dude when they keep wanting to make out through the entire movie and building huge sexual tension it happens that's very true. but it that's what it is <laughs> and the movie well, get gets the name through. but yeah. <laughs> poor the- ryan philippi <laughs> Oh, God. <laughs> I couldn't remember his name. She's like the hot guy, you know. Whatever, yeah, whatever. Really hot guy. No, tell her. I'm, I'm here for it. I'm right there with you. Look, I, I knew some actors' names because they made an impact on my life. He did not. Yeah. Okay. Sarah Michelle did. Right. Yes, I watched That's that. very reasonable. It is. So I've seen some of Blair's just hot. <laughs> I haven't yeah, seen her in yeah. anything else besides Cruel Intentions, I think. Did you? But, uh, this is completely off topic of the book, but did you see the uh, MTV Movie yes, Awards thing? Yes, yeah, where yes. S- s- Sarah Michelle and, and her back thing. For what? anyone who doesn't like know. Like where they brought it back for like from their, their kiss from like yes. years and years yeah, ago. With, yeah, with the plexiglass in between them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, highly because recommend look up COVID. MTV Awards, Sarah Michelle Geller and Selma Blair kiss because it is very good. <laughs> yeah. But. Yeah, Boy, that movie, oh. that movie had all sorts of thirst going on. So thirsty, so thirsty. Oh my god! Uh, and the, but then, like nobody fucks, and so it's just like, god damn it! <laughs> That's true. That so is it's disappointing. Just like one big it's basically this book, though. Like, there's no there. Everybody was so thirsty. Everybody was trying to get it from Sessie, and nobody got it. Like, <laughs> no. Sessie's like, no. Nah. Like, not only that, I didn't even get to touch a titty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like I was like, come on, let him touch a titty. <laughs> Well, Come I, on. I, I think she wanted him to. She, he just yes. didn't. She was definitely but then disappointed. He finds out he she's a reptile, and he's like, like mm, "She's a lizard. I can't overlook that." But he's like, well, "I, I mean, want no, to, he, you he could overlook that because like, she I does look, look like a person." Yeah. No, there's definitely a line really where he's like, thing. "Oh, I can't look past the lizard thing," but damn, she is hot. Oh yeah. <laughs> At the I, very I really... end, like he's like. He, uh, Sessie, whom he had admired and desired for so long, yet in another sense, in another sense, the illusion was shattered forever for him. How could it be otherwise? She was a lizard for God's sakes, a murderous lizard for yeah. like eons, decades, An ancient like, murderous so lizard. For her. <laughs> like, He's got a specific, I, and then they joke about it. Like Tracy, she's like, "You got a weird taste in women." He's like, "Ha ha, oh you!" And hugs her, like snuggle closer while we talk about my crush yeah. on this lizard woman. Like what the fuck? That, that, that is that is another <laughs> that is another Pikeism to end on a really weird and inappropriate joke. That's oh my God, oh no! But Tracy, <laughs> but, uh, I, I do think it's face. interesting that set when Sessy and Davy are kissing. It specifically mentioned she was kissing him back, sort of. Mm-hmm. And also eating her ice cream. And but eating also her eating ice her cream. Her, she cared more like, about her ice cream than kissing him. Well, and I think I think that's one of the things that makes Sessie interesting to me is she definitely fixates on specific things like that dog, like mm-hmm. uh the the mythology of <laughs> Catholicism. So weird. and ice cream and couldn't care less about what Davy wants, mm-hmm. which is good because he's an asshole. Yeah. Cause he sucks. Fuck Davy. Glad he gets burned alive. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But yeah, the sudden incest was weird, but I, I didn't, I didn't hate it because it definitely, I think put the necessary tension in the relationship. And so it made Sessie's later like betrayal, uh, to Davy make more sense that it was just like, yeah, she didn't really like him that much, but he was the last of her kind. And so it was like, I guess they are lovers because like, what else are you going to do? But when it like, he really starts to show how much of an asshole he is. She's like, you know what? I'm fucking done with this. You know, well, I'm and done- all she was waiting for was to see how the ritual worked. So she didn't need him anymore. Yeah. Which is great. Uh, girl power. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but yeah, and so like their their relationship was interesting. So I did say the a lot of the I expected the book to be spookier from the get go, and it didn't really get 
scary to me until they start driving out to the very edges of town and then they go to the abandoned place but like as soon as they hike that mountain and there was the house in the distance i was literally like oh there's some fucked up thing about the house (laughs) oh and then like the part when tracy's in the house like searching was like so tense and like and then that like kept building the tension and then they get to the gully and it's like you have to dig and it was like oh scary and then they're like lizard people and then all the tension went out for me (laughs) so i was like oh now it's stupid (laughs) (laughs) well there's there is an interesting question in what you just said because sessi and davy are both about an hour ahead when she's investigating that house, mm-hmm. the purple lizard has been stepped on. Yes. What is in the bedroom? Mm-hmm. Well, you see the blood from the purple lizard too. Yeah. And so, yeah, the, the, like I, so I have a very vivid, uh, like, ver- like visual imagination. So like I can, I could see this house in my mind and like, I could see it and just, I could hear even the sounds of the lizard in the room. And like, I don't need that resolved. It was scarier that she never opened the door. It was scarier that she never got attacked by it. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's one of their people. Maybe it's not. But it scared the shit out of me. Like that fucking oh, creep. I, I agree not knowing is much scarier. But at the same time, if they're the last two of their race, something is there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's, it's just my curiosity on the myth, the mythos here. Which, Which was not could clear. be expanded in the sequel that Cassie yeah. should write. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Cassie writes Sessy. Let's do it. She didn't even seem upset, too. Like, when he stomps it, like, mm-hmm. at first she greets it. She's like, hello. Like, maybe I was like, oh, maybe it's one of their friends. Maybe they had a baby. Like, yeah. maybe, I don't know. Oh. Purple lizards aren't, like, a thing here. And then she he just stomps it. And it's just like, all right. And they and it. And that it's a giant lizard. And, like, I can testify in, in California, you're not – at least the areas I've been in, you're not going to get like two foot long lizards. Like that's like encroaching on like Komodo dragon size. Yeah. Like that's a big fucking lizard. So, <laughs> but like also like, I think it was spooky because I started to see their powers. Cause I was like, Oh, they're, they're kind of creepy and weird. But I, like at that point I was like, Oh, are they just weird satanist and i was like ah it's gonna be weird satanist i'm always disappointed when stuff is weird satanist because i'm like come on 80s like just come on satanic panic um and then they turned out to be lizard people which i was like well that's better than satanist but i still kind of wish it had been just like creepy vampire people or something you know like that would have been scarier to me Mm. we we do (laughs) The uh, the whole rundown about the Volta mine, yeah, was so it long. It out of so nowhere, long. and it takes forever. It was, and it's like in the middle of no, like out of nowhere. Like they they establish all these characters, they're getting on the scavenger hunt, and then they're like, "Hi, yes, let's take four pages to talk about this mine." And it's like, yeah, "Hey, Rick, let me tell you about this story about that has nothing to do with anything we're doing today." Yeah. And then when he finds the article, the article is like four pages long. And at least it had to do with other things, but it was just like, <laughs> oh my God, <laughs> we get it. The mind is creepy. But but someone as intelligent as Rick would know that, first of all, no newspaper in the 1800s would talk about someone uh, being having his, his face burned away. Yeah. No newspaper would print verbatim. Uh, journal entries, including yeah. dream journals. Yeah. It's it's just ridiculous. Um, and I knew immediately Daniel and Claire Stevens oh, were yeah. Ceci and Davey uh, Stepford. Oh, me- I underlined the D and the C and I was like, it's it's them. I know it. <laughs> but for, for a change, the characters figure that out immediately also. Which was nice, especially because I think it was Tracy who figures it out, too. Yeah, Tracy figures that out, and it's like, okay, good. Then I don't have to sit here and feel like I'm more intelligent than the characters. Yeah, yeah. Which, like, also they're high schoolers, so I'm a little bit more willing to be (laughs) forgiving of them not being super smart. (laughs) So. 
But and this I, is I, I highlighted this gore for Becca because she loves it. His lips, his tongue, his whole mouth has been burned away. Half his face has melted over his shirt. Oh, God. Yeah, that one was gross. Again, uh, they don't print that in the 1800s in a newspaper. I don't I don't think so. I didn't even real like I'm going to be honest, I didn't it didn't occur to me that these weren't things they would print, so I was just like, "Oh, cool, old paper with grisly details." And I was <laughs> every time they had four pages of backstory about that fucking mine, I was like, "Tell me more. I want more <laughs> creepy stuff about this mine." Cuz it was that was the most interesting. I was like, "Get me out of this fucking video store, dude. I do not care you weird you yeah. reference is like this movie I've never heard about or watched. Like, go back to the mine. So when they were at the library and stuff, I loved it. I was so excited for those parts. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're a nerd. I'm getting the impression you may be a nerd. Yeah. Oh, yeah. What I'm realizing too is because it's funny because in video games too, I always like find the books and the games that are just there for like extra stuff, and I'm like, ooh, yes, let's read this and see what it's about. <laughs> and it, yeah, so that's uh, I think that's what happened in this book as well. And I was here for it. <laughs> well, Cassie has a, a history on this show of latching on to these little side ideas that haven't gotten fleshed out in the book, and she's like, <laughs> that's what I want to write. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that I'm story. still I'm working on that whole. You you guys don't even know. There's a whole space I have a vampires. Whole, I, space vampires. They send people to space as like a social media thing. So there's different like to, social media personalities, like a podcaster and like <laughs> uh, like a reality mom and like a person who like I you know an Instagram it. mom. And then they send them to space and and then obviously stuff ensues and then vampires, space vampires. So Ooh. I'm excited. Well, space zombie vampires, kind of. So we'll see, yeah. Okay, so. I I need to talk about the leap that happens here. After we have these entirely way too easy clues on their scavenger hunt. Oh, yeah. They move on to, um, what what is the clue? Terrible lizards uh, in a metal grave. Yes. And and they move to dinosaur bones are a source of oil. Well, I will say it takes them a bit to get there, though. Because they're like, oh, we're driving around... They, like, it does, they, but not a lot of a bit. It takes longer to remember I would have been a contender. Yeah, true. Than it does to get, but at the same time, now that I've highlighted this, I notice Davy is the one that makes the connection. So oh. maybe he didn't get there. He just drew them along with him. I don't know. Mm-hmm. I thought it was Tom makes a comment. Well, Tom and- says oil. But then Davy uh, says dinosaur bones are a source of oil. So, I mean, yeah. it's just a weird leap as far as I can, I'm concerned. Well, he made the clues, so I guess it makes a little bit more sense. And then that does bring us to the idea of whether or not, first, the other students got a different scavenger Yeah. Hunt. Like, are they all? Second, like, that's a lot of work. <laughs> that is a lot of work. Like... It, and because they couldn't have gotten the same scavenger hunt. Mm-mm. So that means another scavenger hunt had to be set up. And then or well, are Mr. all these Archie, students yeah. desperately trying to figure out a clue that has no answer. And they're trying to find Mr. Partridge who's no longer there. Yep. And it's a whole other book. Yeah. The book is the, all the side characters from scavenger hunt going through like an actual yeah. scavenger hunt. <laughs> <laughs> like, Oh God. Yeah. I like, I though that part did also like creep me out when they realized that they were like, who gave us the right. the list? And they were like, Davy. I was like, Oh, Oh, like I was like genuinely like, Oh, shit's getting real creepy right now. Like definitely my favorite bit was as soon as they got out of the, like the major town and got to the, the creepy abandoned plant to, Pretty much until we find out that they're lizard people is when <laughs> yeah. I was like, this is so creepy. Ooh, like, what's it going to be? And it was just like this heightening tension. And that was also definitely one of the details that I was like, ooh, that's really creepy. I did like I didn't even make that connection because there was a couple things I picked up that I was like, oh, that's weird. Oh, that's going to come up later. But that one I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> yeah. So, it's- yeah. I, th- yeah. I think we, as we approach the end here, let's move into the eternal enemy, which is our thoughts on the antagonists, mm-hmm. because we do have this meandering plot by the bad guys yeah, and the fact that Davy just takes so much joy mm-hmm. 
from the torment he is inflicting. And that's what makes him interesting. Like he's toxic masculinity. Yes. But I love the moments where he's just, he just doesn't give a fuck what they think. Mm -hmm. Like he's, when he's talking about Mr. Partridge, uh, he says he was my alter ego. Davey said, you ran the club. Carl asked naturally. Davey said, is he dead? Rick asked. Sure. Davey said, (laughs) Like he doesn't even give a, any fucks. And mm-hmm. it's like, yeah, he's dead. Whatever. I don't care. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I think the, explana- the explanation of he wants the tension, he needs the tension to make it work actually kind of worked for me because I don't necessarily need an explanation for why, a, particularly why a male character is very cruel and shitty. Um, but I kind <laughs> of prefer that to like, it just being, oh, they're lizard people, therefore they're evil. And I was like, mm. right. but it's like, oh, they're lizard people. They're unnecessarily cruel because the tension and the fear helps fuel them. I was like, yeah, that works. I don't, that works for me. <laughs> yeah, here's, here's the line here. It creates a tension that strains the fabric between this world and another. Here the fabric is already very thin. It is a special place. It is my place. And that's that's this Hello, underground this fault. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and here's where we get into the fact that this implies cosmic horror. Yes. Because Davy specifically says there are many hells in this universe. Which should we visit first? Mm-hmm. And then Carl sticks his head into the other world here. He saw the other side where Ceci and Davy had come from. His vision expanded, became unlocalized. Suddenly he could see in a multitude of directions at once. He realized there were many chambers beyond the doorway, each as large as an entire world. Each lay one upon the other, and he understood what Davy had meant when he said there were many hells in the universe. Each world was a horror. Yeah. And then there's also the description, too, of the the swimming... And the the pool of like so like extra sulfuric acid, yeah, which yeah is like very like implied that they're like immune to it, but like use it against people. I don't know, like, but I did find that creepy. Like the idea of faces melting off is like very fucking creepy to me. Oh yeah, I also did. I ended up looking up Volta because Rick specifically is like, oh, that's a weird name for a mine, and I was like, what's a normal name for a mine? Uh. <laughs> But I looked it up and there's not, it's not because I thought it was going to be this thing like Volta means this. And oh, I don't, I, I don't have the look off the top of my head, but it it's related to like, I think a Dutch word. Like, let me. Yeah. I, I've, I've found it borrowed from the Proto-Germanic Valda, which means might, power, and authority. Yeah. And I was like, I guess that's probably what it is. Um. It's like yeah, that's what, I, but I thought it was going to be something specific, but it wasn't, which I thought I was... thought I thought so too, as soon as they said it, because I mean the the easiest leap would be a vault, yeah, that's what I thought too, <laughs> uh, but they didn't go there, so i yeah. I w- found myself like, okay, there's got to be a reason, yeah, but no, 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 no reason, yeah. But like it, it's it's funny to me because like I'm I'm really picky about these things sometimes where like sometimes I'm like I need more explanation like I need more lore I need more understanding of how this works and some stuff I'm just like no that's that's enough for me and like that was one that I was a little bit like if you're gonna say that's a weird name for a mine I need it to mean a little bit more you yeah know? like Rick should have found something at the library yeah. And said, this is what Volta means. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's it's interesting. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's interesting uh, and, and, what holes that he, in my opinion, kind of purposely leaves in. Oh, yeah, for sure. Like, he's, you know, he has a reason for it. Yeah. And when we get him on the podcast, we will ask him. <laughs> <laughs> Specifically, why didn't you write another book about Sessie? <laughs> Yeah. Yes, I want to exactly. know when she comes back and she terrifies a poor old horny Carl. <laughs> <laughs> also, the fact that at the end they imply that they're going to get married and live forever, even though like they've never been on a date, like they're just oh, I like. Know. I was like, so no, <laughs> no, 
Tracy can do better. I'm sorry. I'm going to just say it. <laughs> so we have the horrifying moment where mm-hmm. they dig up Mr. Partridge. Mm-hmm. And I don't understand why he's buried under there either. Yeah. How did he get there? <laughs> because he was she just told at him the to school. Bury himself. Cause she, I guess he gave him the order and was like, bury yourself like as deep as you can. But like, <laughs> That's not an like, it's like that that SpongeBob gif then of him like jumping into the square shaped <laughs> hole and then putting the sand up, like, <laughs> pushing it up like over his head. You. you just see his little glasses glinting because they're yeah. sticking out with his nose. <laughs> that that's spider that buries it's itself, you know the, yeah. So, oh, that's crazy. But and then they they tear his face off, and and uh, Joe's sister is able to identify. Her brother from his lower teeth on the skull. No, it's his. It's, 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 it's Paula. Or the it's girlfriend. His girlfriend. Paula. Yeah, because she made out oh, with him. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. If, if I, I have lived with my partner for a, over a year now, and if you showed me a skull and went, "This is his teeth," I'd be like, "Sure." <laughs> like I don't know. I don't recognize people by their teeth unless they have really fucked up teeth <laughs> like, right they, they really would need to up. have incredibly bad teeth yeah well, they mentioned that he didn't have braces and he has really crooked like bottom teeth and so they're like you recognize that those teeth right and so maybe it was like very fucked up and like that'd have to be because they really made it fucked up. up i don't know, <laughs> I know but i don't how else would you i mean two people recognize this motherfucker's teeth they must have been <laughs> really, really, really bad <laughs> they must have been like old tombstones falling over Poor each Joe. other Poor Joe. Oh, yeah. Poor. Oh, I mean, really, out of everyone in this, poor Joe the most, honestly. He's yeah, definitely... Joe is brought back to life by a monster, is told his best friend let him drown, mm-hmm. is forced to live inside another person, mm-hmm. and presumably know that his skeleton was used for still another person. Yeah. All to get rid like, like, there is... He he is he's like a lobotomized character at this point. Yeah, yeah. It's and, it's and then, so and wild. Then he die. and then he, he's like, I can't stay here because magic, I guess. Um, <laughs> so, yes, magic. Like, oh god. And it's because well, Paul is like, they have to make sacrifices, so they have to kill people, and he didn't want to kill people to stay. Yeah. Oh I, yes, right. Yeah. But he, he's not a lizard person. He's just a zombie, basically. But I, I don't know. I was fine with that explanation, but it was still I, – I was laughing at the fact that, like, Paula was crying over her true love. And I'm like, no, 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 no. High school boyfriend. She's yeah, going to yes. be fine. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Like, well, and, you know, it's funny because – the explanations are so ridiculously convoluted that it would be easy for them to also be shitty. Yeah. But they're not. Yeah. They're just surprising Ridiculous. and confusing. But that works because you really get the same sense that these characters would be having when someone from a primordial lizard people uh, is explaining to you their big plan. Oh God. I still can't get over the lizard people reveal. And I as soon as it happened to, I was like, does he do this a lot? Does he do lizard people a lot? He, I I mean, I know he does have lizard people, and Cassie mentioned uh in another book there's lizard people, but this is a very abstractly different book for him. Hmm. At the same time, it's very typical, Pike. So it's it's a really uh, like one of the things that's most typical Pike about it is it begins with a character telling the story of what has happened so far yep. to a neutral third party. Yep. That shit and, priest. He's like like he tells oh, him yeah. he killed someone and he's like, What? And it's like, dude, you're supposed to be like confession. Shut the fuck up. <laughs> like yeah. So yeah, let's get let's get back to our our enemies here. Yes. Um, yes. Ceci snaps Rick's neck so he won't feel the death of the the oh, sacrifice. Acid. Yeah. Which I think means he doesn't count. That's what they kept implying that too. Also, 
As someone who is a Rick stan and thinks Rick is the best character, I was so mad that he's the only, like, of the main ones who died. Yeah. I was like, come on. He was the best. And the, and the fact that they justify it with, like, well, he was a he was a cripple. And I put it in heavy quotation marks because that's right. not a great word. But he was, like, a crippled kid because uh, – and so he wasn't going to live long anyway. And, and I'm like, that's – still. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. It's, it's it's a really rough reasoning yeah. for why it's okay. Yeah. Um I think <clears throat> so from my understanding of it, what happened was that they have the ritual that they have to do to send somebody to that other place that they come from is for them to speak that chant thing. So when she did the chant, the counter chant, it negated the effects oh, of sending I see. Him to that place. And then she snapped his neck. So he died before going there. And then she threw him through the doorway. So even though oh. his dead body went through the doorway his soul or whatever it was like did not get taken to that place which is also why they couldn't bring him back like they brought so like oh. how, which, but this is the part that doesn't make sense because they didn't do a ritual to bring joe but then they also do mention how in the past if you die angry that lets them in and he died angry because he thought that his friend was watching him die because he saw him standing up there as he was drowning oh. so they explain this all, but they do it in such – like Pike does it in this book in such a weird way that like I yes. kept having these revelations at the wrong moments. Like, yeah. they just, and yeah. Yeah. Later, I was like, oh, shit, wait. That's because of that. So like mm -hmm. it was weird. And, the, and was weird. in the church in the last like five pages, Sessie's explaining it and I'm like, okay, I, I guess that that follows the internal logic <laughs> of the book, but it's like – because, like, for instance, she's explaining the ritual thing. The thing that did makes because it seems like she did it to spite Davy to, like, take away his power. Oh, yeah, uh, totally. And so I'm like, that part works for me. But the way it worked was, like, convoluted. Because <laughs> yeah. it was like, also the other thing, too, is they say at one point, the part, this part was, like, unnecessary, where they're like, oh, both of you washed down to here in Volta, and actually, Carl, you're dead. Oh, yeah, saying Carl was dead, it's the twist that's not a twist. It's, and, it's just, <laughs> and then he's, like, five pages later, they're like, JK, it was a fake knife, and it's like, what the fuck? Like, <laughs> that part not not because I feel the stab? Yeah. Oh, right, yeah. yeah. And it was like, okay, so then what did happen? Did did Joe actually wash down there? Like, what happened? So, yeah, no, it, it happened exactly the way we thought it did the entire book. Mm hmm Yeah, it's... <sighs> but, so that, that's but what, again, that part was also just unnecessary. And then the part that also... Okay, so I'll put this on the table. Like, I am an atheist. I'm not one of those shithead atheists that hates religion. But, like, mm -hmm. the... The I am uh, one of those shithead atheists who do hate religion. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, I am. Yeah. Well, I think it's more like I, I have a lot of criticisms of Christianity specifically, but like don't know enough about other stuff. But like the sudden ending of being like, and God saved them. I was like, no. <laughs> Can we? But I don't not? think God did save them. But like, like love of God saved them was like kind oh, of Oh yeah, Tra uh, Tracy says that, doesn't she? Yeah, oh, it's, oh let me pull up the stupid ass. My thing. love for I, Carl I, is the greatest power in yes. the universe. It's a blessing from God. Yes, I Honestly, I, if I'm Carl at that point, it's like, whoa. 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 <laughs> yeah, I underlined that one and went, "Lol, what?" which is my last note in the book. <laughs> 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 was just Lol, what? Because my love for Carl is the greatest power? Yeah. Girl, you just I mean, saw a woman, like, break someone's neck and <laughs> hypnotize you. What do you mean your love is the greatest power? Like, you've seen like, a lot No, Sessie is the greatest power. Yes. Sessie's hot. She can mesmerize you. She can, like, I'm like, no, man. <laughs> She's apparently got an amazing white bottom. She can swim. <laughs> Like, and an unbroken, like, no lines in her tan, like, just perfectly see, perfect tan skin. Right? Like, she Damn. Got it all going for her. Her hair dries into perfect curls as it should. Mm -hmm. Amazing. And it's apparently, just, incredible eyes, incredible yeah. tits, as we have established for Carl like, so many times. You can't, <laughs> like, can't see the depth of. I love it. Yeah. Oh, my God. But yeah, that, that line, I was just like, I'm. <laughs> I'm so glad this book is almost done because I couldn't with that line specifically. <laughs> like, and the, like the whole, like, it wasn't completely like religion saved them, but it was like highly implied that, like, yeah. 
the ritual and the power of religion helped convert Ceci to their side. And I was like, I don't like that. <laughs> I don't dig that at all. See, and I, I, think I just took it as Ceci is fucking with some other religion. Mm. I, I just, you know, like, I just oh, took it as oh, like. Yeah, I mean, because Ceci is ancient. How does she not know about God? Mm-hmm. That's fair. Yeah. 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 You know, even if you don't believe, there have been 2,000 years of people demanding you listen to it. Yeah. Well, that's why I'm saying because they, they mentioned how they came before all of the people. So they would have been there before all of that, like religion was yeah. established. And so I, it, so it makes sense that she should know like who this is and she should have heard about this. Like, where have you guys been? Like you said, you've been killing people and doing all this. How do you not know about like Catholicism? Like this is a very basic thing that I feel like, <laughs> right. yeah. about, like on TV or something, you know, like, um, but also, while. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, but also I, I think that it's, I don't know. I feel like it wasn't super. I understand what you're saying about the religious aspect, but I think it was more like she was like above it and like better than it because then even at the end where Tracy's kind of getting all like, oh, it's all like God or whatever. Like it's my love. The other girl can basically just kill them all. Like she's like, I could have just ended all of this, but I spared you. So it's, Mm -hmm. it wasn't more so like God is the one that's on top of them all. It was like, Ceci is like, she, she could have ended all of them. We're all team Ceci here. If we're being real. (laughs) I wish I really, I'm so sad that Becca's not here because I really feel like Becca would have loved Ceci. She she would love Ceci. Like a badass bitch. Like, Yeah. I, we're gonna have to make her read this one, Cooper. We have to tell her, even though she's not recording this. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, for I was gonna sure. say I want a Becca follow up on her feeling. Like, <laughs> I think it, my ranking for characters definitely goes Rick above everybody easily. Love Rick, um, just because I always love the sassy characters, and then yeah. I liked that the sassy character was the kid in the wheelchair, and then Sassy, and then everybody else. <laughs> yeah, uh, if if those two are your favorite characters, you will really like monster and uh you know there there are a number of pike books you'll really dig oh yeah i figure because i I also i love me my uh manic pixie nightmare sluts (laughs) (laughs) so no we stand those here we love them we stand yeah i was like i feel ultimate goals honestly yeah but yeah oh my god can we There's read out some of the horny sassy quotes at some point yeah we're 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 about to get there okay about to get there (laughs) so i do before we get there yes there's a moment where Carl asks Ceci about his dream where he's running away from a dam and a monster drops into it. Mm-hmm. And he says, who was the monster? And she says, the future. Yeah. That's her. It's Ceci. Ceci's going to come back and get him. <laughs> oh. I love it. And also that dream was so creepy to me. I know that JJ, I know you said you didn't get creepy for, until later, but I was like, the little boys on tricycles, like, and then this huge, like, overwhelming flood, and then a creature? Yeah. Yeah. The creature, the the lightning strike and the creature, I was like, yeah, this does sound like a nightmare. Like, this sounds legitimately scary to have and happen. He, does, he, he writes nightmares really well. Yeah. Like, uh, when um, Whisper of Death opens with a nightmare where where people take off their gloves and their, their skeletons underneath. Hmm. <laughs> And yeah. it, so it's, it's, it's a recurring thing. And it just really, uh, it's, it's fascinating to me. Mm-hmm. I, I want to mention before we lose the plot, <laughs> I, I combined this book and whisper of death in my memory because of the desert settings and the, uh, the sort of oppressive feel of these stories, like the, in, in, uh, in whisper of death, JJ, there mm-hmm. is a uh, a story that's told about a guy walking along a ledge looking for a place that he can jump down, but the ledge is getting thinner and thinner until it becomes like a razor blade, Ooh. and he falls and slices himself in half. Huh. Oh, fuck. Yeah, that is the most vivid Pike thing in my memory, period. It's going to be in my head now. <laughs> but you at the same time, this. all this stuff at the church feels like this weird like darkness about it like uh, again almost post-apocalyptic like the world is gone outside the church the only safe place is the church yeah and because of that i thought this this death of the priest happened in whisper of death and i completely didn't remember it was separate book until it happened here and then i actually thought it happened in the uh the sequel to the exorcist legion 
mm-hmm. because a priest gets decapitated in a confessional in that book. Oh, jeez. And so it's like I've combined a whole bunch of things in my memory uh, into into you know these these Pike stories. So I, mean, I just I just wanted to mention that because it it yeah. fascinated me when we were when I was reading it. it. And it makes sense too when like when an author uses a lot of tropes over and over again, like mm-hmm. it's it's easy to combine them. I think. So well, speaking of tropes in Pike, oh boy, there is nothing more tropey in Pike than thirst. Our section about titillation and sexuality yes. in Pike's world. Yes. So JJ, you've been champing at the bit here. <laughs> what hit no. us with? Hit us with some uh, some thirsty lines. Oh my God! Well, I got one on page uh, thirteen where <laughs> uh, this is talking about the monster that falls out of the sky. And it's like, uh, it was a monster that devoured the living, especially little boys, which it found particularly tasty. Ooh. I hate little boys and tasty being in the same sentence. Honestly, Um, I feel that monster has got to be a direct it reference. Oh. Because it comes from the stars. It devours children. It feels like, uh, because... Pike has thrown Stephen King in his books a number of times. So it feels like that is a, a distinct through line there. Mm-hmm. The dream reminded me of King too, a little bit like, of yeah. it. like I really, I do see the nod there and I really feel like that must have been some sort of like big influence. Mm-hmm. And the trauma of something. What, what's really interesting about the dream is he's taking the trauma that happened a year ago and he's applying it to him as a kid. Right. So mm-hmm. it's it's this really unique post traumatic stress, yeah. Because it could have easily have happened when he was a kid, but it didn't. It happened last year, you know. So I yeah, I found that very interesting. But anyway, yeah. thirst more horny. I've got more. <laughs> You've got more. I've got more. one here. Um, okay. He's sitting here on the deck of the pool watching me swim. Says he giggled again. I'm naked. <laughs> Sounds like fun. Carl said. <laughs> yep. Oh, so many of mine are specifically the pool ones because the one the pool oh, yeah. one I have is uh oh specifically um she was definitely naked, he realized, and he could glimpse no break in the uniformity of her wonderful tan. She probably went skinny dipping all the time. He wished she wouldn't splash quite so much so the water could calm down and let him see I'm turning into dot, a dot, pervert. Dot. Yeah. And then like later, like he says, I'm turning into a pervert, like a couple lines down, the top of her right breast lifted above the waterline and a very fine top of the breast it was. <laughs> I can't get over a very fine top of the breast it was. Oh, you have to continue though. Sessie was built. Not only not did only- she have him distracted, she had him suckered. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, I've got one. Yeah. From Rick. Ooh. So Tracy says they look alike. They look exactly alike. Yes, about I know which one. Davey and Sessie. And Rick said, not exactly. Sessie has far more dynamic memory glands. <laughs> which was easily the worst line from Rick. Because I was like, Oh, Rick. my God. God, yeah. he's so much better than that. <laughs> oh my God. Oh yeah. Uh, I've, yeah, I've got like, a few more. If, if you have more, uh, I have more. But you can you can go ahead as I find some. Okay. Uh, Ceci chewed her strawberries slowly, savoring, so it seemed to him, the feel of them in her mouth more than their taste. Her wet white bathrobe almost loose enough to make his disappointment of a few minutes ago a thing of the distant past see and that's not only thirsty writing that's actually really good writing yeah uh i have one also might... very pervy yes i'm i have one that might surprise people because it's not about sassy because okay. there's a paragraph where carl's talking about joe that's like a little homoerotic um really Yes. So this is on page 53. The only time he had even remotely felt alive were when he had gone hiking in the mountains and the desert with Joe, when they had sat together late at night besides a crackling fire, talking about the future. 
Joe had always been looking forward to what the years would bring, but all they had brought that he was uh, is what they had brought everyone in the end only a whole lot sooner. But the feeling alive with Joe, yeah, that's a little yeah. homoerotic. When and that is something we see uh, here in Pike. And it's it's always fascinating to me. And what's what's great is our entire podcast is made up of queers. We're all <laughs> queer. Oh, so yeah. when when queer shows up, even just these little flares of it, it's just like aha! I like, see aha. you. <laughs> Give me that little morsel of queer. <laughs> yes, yeah. because we only because it was the eighties and nineties, so we only get a little bit. Mm-hmm. But when it happens, it's delicious. Yes. <laughs> oh, okay, oh, I got, I got a, another I got sexy a, one. Hit it. He still wasn't sure if she had on any underwear. She asked his help in brushing off. That was fun. Carl was pretty sure she didn't have any on. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Um, You're going hiking. <laughs> yeah, my, mine is uh, from later in their hike. She was not wearing a bra. And the drenching reminded him again how full her breasts were, how smooth ran the curve of her hips, as if he needed reminding. And this is, (laughs) mind you, after she's poured all the water all over herself. Yeah, all of their water. Oh, 111 degrees. Mm -hmm. And didn't immediately grab onto him to get him to have some of the evaporation, you know? (laughs) Yeah. Uh, I think that's also when... Because that's when they start going out into the desert and things start getting creepy. The like mm-hmm. corny stuff gets a like starts to calm down a little bit. Oh yeah, yeah. At, at that point, it's just man. Remember when she wasn't the lizard person and I could be horny for her? Yes, exactly. <laughs> so yeah, I, I have two of the flip side of thirst. Ooh. So as we mentioned, that for Christopher Pike, thirst is these ridiculous, uh, sexy comments or. Mm -hmm. desperate loving comments oh god and so this is from tracy uh thinking about carl's eyes oh god um she she couldn't ignore his eyes not if the features were studied from afar or from say a photo so she's just staring at carl's photo when she's alone in her bedroom just staring at it oh man and this one is just weird to me. Um, Carl is noticing Sessie flirting with a guy. He was not the first guy Sessie had flirted with this school year. And even though there was only a week left of class, he probably wouldn't be the last. So if if we're talking about a school year that is all but a week over. That's fast. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's, yeah. Yeah. I do have so, one yeah. more horny thing. Yes. Uh, once again, we get a little bit of the homoeroticism. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, it's Davy. Davy directed them to the area at the tip of the triangular slab. He made them go down on their knees. The stance appealed to him. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I'm like, it's definitely a servitude thing, but at the same time, we're talking about a dude wanting to see and people. You can these. really go with the idea that ancient beings have different sexual appetites than humans. <laughs> True. I think Sessie's is actually just food. I think she's just a feedy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> she just which wants is, to eat. <laughs> which, which is a recurring pike thing and <laughs> uh, something that. I share with Pike is a, a devout love for women who eat. And, um, Oh boy. It, it's, it's Davey walked across the street to get Sessie. Carl had never seen a girl in his life who could eat so much and not get fat. Mm-hmm. It's Which like, is funny. Cause Tracy talks about how she, she eats yes. so much and can't get fat. Yeah. But you know what? She's just a real good kid. She's a good kid. Cute. Good kid. Such a good, cute cute kid. Like, oh, God. But yeah, there was just so many times where I'm like, this is a, this is a horny, but like, weird horny. Like, the the one that was like the description of her right breast coming out of the water. Like, very specific. Like, everything has slowed down now in slow motion. Yeah. 
Which is like, I don't know, we've all felt that way about some titties, but like I would never be able to go specifically the right breast <laughs> when it came out of the water. Perfect. What I mean, a right breast it was. What a right breast it was indeed. <laughs> and and then then you have to add on. And it was only eclipsed by the left, which <laughs> Or her perfect tan. Her or her her perfect seamless tan. Seamless that tan. indicated she did a lot of skinny dipping. Yes, right. Oh my god. <laughs> so then we get into our section die softly, which mm. is moralizing and problematic elements in the writing and plot. Ooh, I got uh, marks for this. We we've, we've talked a lot about the um use of the word cripple, which is problematic now, but we have to acknowledge that at the time it was used very frequently, um, but it is definitely a problematic thing now. Mm -hmm. You said you have more for this, JJ? Yes. Uh, at one point, they say that Mr. Partridge went to the Orient. Oh, yes. And I was like, yikes. Um, but the big one that I kept noticing, like definitely like the way they treated Rick was like, problematic but like still like i was still impressed that he was a well-developed character beyond his disabilities sure. but they kept talking about the indians and that yeah. was very cringy and at one point there is straight up a quote so heads up for racist quote um <laughs> this is from davy so it's it's also sort of the thing of like yeah this is a bad character saying it but it's still really bad where he's like and the Indians were always killing each other for the least little things. Yeah. And it's like, Ugh. Yeah. like even having a bad character say that, I'm like, suddenly racism. <laughs> <laughs> it It is something we wade through in, in any book, really, from the 80s and 90s. Even early 2000s, oh, yeah. I feel like oh, yeah. we, stood, we didn't get really good about starting to call out racism in media until like, pretty recently in my opinion but in general this doesn't feature like like you said the well-developed character for rick sort of negates some of the way uh we might otherwise feel if the character was not as strong mm -hmm. um and there isn't a lot of moralizing in this book which is unusual for him in mm -hmm. that there is there's no mention of you know, Carl's lust for Sessie being the problem, mm -hmm. you know, because uh, a character might be punished for that in yeah. another Pike book. Oh, uh, yeah. So and I found like, that interesting. The thing. Well, I, yeah. I found it. And that's why I think I found the relig the sudden religion stuff so jarring because the mo most of the book wasn't moralizing. Like I expected there to be something about like, oh my God, he's being so horny for Sessy. Something's going to bad going to happen. But it's like, well, he fell into their trap. Like it wasn't exactly his fault that he was seduced by the woman trying to seduce him into this trap, you know? <laughs> right. And like Tracy's clearly horny for Carl and it works out for her. She gets Carl, um, which was cool. Because I also of just, God. Yeah, because of God. So that, but that was the part that like, I think why the religion part was so startling to me because it was suddenly like, oh, the moral of religion and it the, the this is going to help convert Sessy a little bit and that's why she suddenly is on their side and they you know like like uh cassie brought up that wasn't completely what it was but like it it seemed to be going in that direction and i was just like ah, I don't, no thank you <laughs> well let's move into the season of passage which is one of my favorite sections where we we reread uh highlights from the book and I'm I'm going to start this section now with Pikeisms, mm -hmm. because I found so many in this book. <laughs> uh, again, we mentioned opening with a dream, opening midway through, and then telling a story in flashback. Mm -hmm. A dead friend who died a year ago, to the day that mm -hmm. has happened multiple times. Absent parents. I, Carl's I marked dad that drives a too. truck. Yeah, yeah, and hasn't been home in weeks. It just. It almost almost all of Pike's characters have no parents in their lives. Really. I totally I, I totally thought that as a Pikeism too. Like I wrote that down. But then we get to our, our most famous Pikeism. McDonald's gets a mention. What? 
Yeah, in in the first few books we read, he mentioned McDonald's. The characters went to McDonald's multiple times, like over and over. And we thought, this is weird. And so then we started watching for McDonald's. And we have a McDonald's mention in this one. If they were eating at McDonald's and he needed ketchup, spelled catsup, which I always find amusing, for his fries. This we're talking about Rick. She made him get it, even though the condiments were on the top of a high shelf. Oh yeah, so that was cringy. Not only is it McDonald's, but it's cringy abuse of Rick. Yeah, yeah. Like, what girl? Just help your brother, <laughs> please. And then the last of my Pike isms is uh, what we call the female gaze, which is when a Pike female character evaluates the body of another female character because it happens a lot and uh about sessi carl wasn't the only one who noticed her deeply tanned body was nothing short of sensational (laughs) what about her uh, superior mammary glands (laughs) Uh, yeah uh, tracy doesn't seem as impressed with them as uh rick was she's a tan girl (laughs) So those are my those are my pikeisms. Cassie, did you have anything I missed? No, not for pikeisms. And JJ, for this being your first pike book, you really nailed those pikeisms right off the bat. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> so then the second part of the season of passage is the best and worst writing. And I'm really happy that I didn't have anything stand out to me as worst writing. And I have a number of quotes for best writing. Mm. But before I do that, uh, do either of you have anything for this section? I have literally one thing highlighted in this book. So it's not like a best or worst, but it didn't fit into thirsty either. But I just. <laughs> <laughs> Bring it on. It, it, okay. All right. And I, I'm going to be honest. I only highlighted the last part of the sentence, but I'll read the whole sentence. Okay. Okay. But, I mean, you don't have to reveal that. That's not a, there is no transparency rule. Here okay. On, well, you'll be able to hear the best part of the sentence. Okay. Before he could get up to the step area, she had flipped over and pushed off the side and passed him underwater like a mermaid riding a torpedo. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I noticed that one too. Yes. It's just the visual is the best thing. Like a mermaid. Like I picture that so well. I love it. Wow. Yeah. And that actually fits into Pike's noir style. Like a mermaid (laughs) mermaid riding a torpedo. Torpedo? Oh, okay. Okay. I can see it now. No, this is a delivery. If if you if you can hear it in Humphrey Bogart narration, you know it's (laughs) noir. Yeah, I, I, I'll call like that. I, I, I have it. a noir uh, lover lust in Say It. He just wanted her. And yes. he wanted her bad. <laughs> yep. I I mean, I will say for like, right, like, because I'm a writer. Like, I don't write books. Like, I write, you know, my podcast. And so I like a lot of the writer stuff for me was like the plot convoluted stuff was what I considered to be the kind of quote unquote bad writing but I also thought some of the horny shit was just not good <laughs> like I was like no uh so I read a lot of the things that I was like that's not very good writing um well, let, my... me, let me let me paint a picture for you JJ okay you're you're in your you're in your teenage uh or or childhood teenage bedroom reading goosebumps <laughs> and someone someone has handed you this Christopher Pike book because you like young adult horror. Uh huh. Because that is where Cassie and I first encountered Pike in this, this mode where we're reading kitty horror. Mm-hmm. And then suddenly this guy comes in and people are talking about boobs and getting <laughs> their neck snapped and skin is coming off. What the yeah. fuck? Yeah, yeah, this is like very clearly like high school young adult writing, yeah. which I kind of but we appreciate. didn't know that at the time oh because this God. was sold in the Scholastic Guide, you know, with oh with God. all the young adult stuff. That's that's wild, but yeah, like I don't know if it was necessarily bad, but I was just like, really. <laughs> um, but actually, so there's one particular thing in the beginning, the very first page, because they're like. I didn't think there was any passages necessarily that I was like, this is not, this is a badly written passage. And I think there was actually a couple of passages that I was like, 
oh, that was really cool and spooky, especially towards the end. But this one, this one particular line, I was just like, okay, was up ahead of them at the end of the gully was a huge dam. Joe understood the whole concept of the dam pretty well. <laughs> he he okay. understood what, what dams are, which we needed to know. <laughs> so, That's interesting. I think I just passed over that. Yeah, I, but like that one stood out because I was just like, what a weird, awkward phrasing. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Uh, I have a I have a number of uh, lines in my great section. Mm -hmm. um, the church was old. It stood at the edge of the tiny rundown town like a cathedral built in defiance of wind and dust, held fast by weed choked desert and desperate night. Then oh. that that desperate night line, I think, sums up the feeling to me of a lot of this work mm -hmm. is it's, it's dark, but it's, it's angry dark. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it, it is squeezing you. The darkness itself is squeezing you. And that's what I feel in these, in these stories where we start like in the desert, it's like, there is mm -hmm. an oppressive force. That's not just the bad guy. Yeah. And I find that so frightening and i try to use that kind of thing in my work all the time i didn't notice that it, at all <laughs> <laughs> like wouldn't wouldn't you say yes. that all of my dream sequences sort yes. of follow that yes <laughs> completely and totally oh yeah i like i was reading this book and i i was like oh boy i can see the comparison you see the influence? completely and totally I, I wear them on my sleeve. It's unabashed. Your horny lines are good. I think some <laughs> horny lines are bad. <laughs> like, well, thank you. My so, horny lines are also much queerer. Yes. I Yeah. So there's going to be that inherent bias. But yeah. I don't know. Also, there's the bias of yours are about adults being horny. And this is about teenagers being horny. And teenagers true. are dumb when they're horny. <laughs> they're just stupid. Um, I will say, actually, for a lot of the good lines, I did like a couple of the passages, but actually, I think this is why uh, Rick got so endeared to me, was a lot of my favorite lines were his comebacks. Yeah. Just so like I read the one earlier about noise pollution, but I marked this one. Uh, uh, Tracy is talking to Rick about Ceci. Is it a well-known fact that guys like uh, guys like girls with bodies like hers? She asked Rick. I haven't seen any research on the subject. <laughs> I was like, Isn't that the same one where he says nuclear physicists are uh, are better at sex than? Oh, I don't, I don't think, I don't quite think so. No, I think that's later. Oh, okay, yeah, because he did say that. He said it's it's known fact that nuclear physicists are better at sex than I. I can't remember what he was comparing it to, but it was yeah. specifically directed towards Sessy and Davy. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, yeah, I think it's when they all meet up that he says that one. But yeah, I was just like, that's an, like a lot of his comebacks are yeah. just very, very funny. Oh yeah. Like here's another one that I really liked. Um, also just a dark ass line from Paula. Paula. I don't know. Just something about him. Paula said, distracted. So are you going to kill yourself or do you give a damn? Yeah. <laughs> and then Rick's like, you might want to offer her a third choice. <laughs> I was like, amazing. Because I'm like, I could absolutely, like, that line from Paula, I'm like, a little ridiculous, but, like, they've set her up to be kind of ridiculous. And I just think that that comeback is really funny. So, I don't know. I just found him to be, like, so funny in a way that was believable, but not so, like, clever that you're like, all right, no one, no one's that clever. No one talks that way. So, yeah. That was a lot of my favorite lines. Can you tell that I do comedy? <laughs> That's what I go after. <laughs> I've got, I've got so you know, it's funny. I, you, you uh, highlighted a lot of dialogue and I have only highlighted prose, I think. Hmm. No, I do have one line of, but it's, it's a, it's a big descriptive uh, dialogue. <laughs> so I have guilt. Sometimes it seemed to him the only emotion holding his insides together. He looked back at his life and wondered where he had been while it had taken place. Hmm. 
And that's that's definitely like a um, quarter or midlife crisis line. That's not a teenager line. Mm. That's that's mm-hmm. a that's a Christopher Pike looking back at his life and wondering where he'd been while it took place. <laughs> Oh yeah, it was like looking up the his background. He did a lot of jobs before he ended up being a writer. He did. And and he tried really hard to get uh his adult fiction published and wound up getting this job because of um basically a a knockoff uh, like a, a cheerleader's book he wrote. Yeah. Uh for a series and then he wound up writing for Point Horror and then he became a brand, which is exciting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know. But it, it definitely limits what you can do at that point. Yeah. Um, I have here, his was the face of the lost creature that lay hidden yes. inches below the surface of the world's last undiscovered cesspool, preserved in unrelenting misery through a hundred ages, waiting for its day. Yeah, I loved some of the descriptions of Davy and Sessie. Yeah, and and then then the end of Davy here, like his many victims before him, Dave did not go quickly or pleasantly. <laughs> but this was this was interesting to me because of what it implies. When Dave is on fire, then the fire seemed to get sucked inward, drawing fuel from his internal organs rather than his clothes and the oxygen in the air. The surrounding temperature shot upward as the flames soared swiftly through the spectrum of color from orange to yellow to blue, searing into a blinding purple that brought forth from Davy a high shrill note that held within it as much surprise as it did pain. Maybe he was seeing God at last and God was not pleased. <laughs> I did like the God. Actually do you have one prose paragraph too. Yeah. In, the, in the similar section. Cause I loved a lot of the prose in the church, but I didn't love the God stuff. So I had very mixed feelings about that. Sure. Um, as Ceci surveyed the rows of burning wicks, the lights reflected clearly in the depths of her flawless blue, black eyes. Tracy saw an ancient continent ablaze with the rivers of incandescent lava, pouring forth from countless volcanoes thrust upon the depths of the earth, and Tracy knew that she was seeing the ruin of Ceci's civilization, as Ceci had seen it, knowing also that Ceci had been young when the cataclysm struck. Yeah, I had that highlighted as well. That is a great, great hey. paragraph. <laughs> um, my last one is... Uh, from Ceci's wrap up at the end, you know, mm-hmm. we, we do get the dueling uh, monologuing and Ceci's is not as good as Davies, but she does have a really great paragraph here. Uh, I have walked in your world a thousand times. I have tasted every physical pleasure you can imagine and many you cannot, but lately they have all begun to taste the same to me. I must be bored. I bore easily. Although our race was old by your standards when it was destroyed, when it destroyed itself, it was also very young. We were like children, spoiled, impatient, quick to anger. That is why Davy and I settled in your high school. We wouldn't have fit in your adult world. So it's a jab at children, too, teenagers, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I do actually like the ongoing theme of the swimming in the water because we were talking about like there is possibility for a sequel in this because of mm-hmm. Sessie. And I did want to like talk about this one part because I thought it was just so ominous and threatening. Um, then she suddenly moved forward and kissed Carl on the lips before he could turn his head, using her immense strength to press her warm mouth to his ear and pull him away from Tracy. When that time comes, You won't recognize me, she whispered. But for the present, I'll give you a clue you may want to remember. I'm going to offer to take you swimming. And I'm going to allow you to look all you want. (laughs) And I was like, damn. And then, like, she leaves and Tracy calls her a bitch, which is also amazing. (laughs) But I was just like, God, like, creepy but horny. Like, I'm scared and turned on. (laughs) Ominous but sexy. Yeah. Yeah. Which I like, that's why I liked Sessie. I feel like that quote is just her warning him that she's going to come back later as a giant lizard that breaks a dam that kills him on a tricycle. (laughs) He's going to be an old man on a tricycle. (laughs) (laughs) 
the future. <laughs> well, no, it, it's like that riddle of the Sphinx. What has uh, four legs in the morning, oh, yeah. two legs in the afternoon, and three legs in the evening? <laughs> Carl. Carl. That is the answer to <laughs> the Sphinx's the answer. riddle. Yeah. So Okay, um, that brings us to last act, ooh. where we give our final thoughts and our rating out of five pikes. So to let you know how this works, JJ, we are we are rating it for what it is, which is teen horror. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, you can you can give it uh, just pikes, or you can give it pikes with little things attached. We often will stick a head on there. Uh, <laughs> however, you want to do it, it is very flexible, and you get to go first as oh. our guest. Oh, okay. Um. Gosh, it's it's hard because I'd rate certain sections higher than others. Like, I'd literally give five stars to the section of between them hiking up the mountain to them finding out they're lizard people. Like I said, that part genuinely creeped me out. I really enjoyed it. The horny bits are really dumb, but I kind of enjoyed the dumb. Um, I'd give it like 3.75 pikes. Okay. okay. I know that's like really because I'm like I can't I don't think I can quite give it a four, but three point three point five seems too low because I did enjoy it. Like I did really have a good time reading it. So yeah, that was some mm, horny with a side of ketchup. <laughs> <laughs> Fair so. enough. Fair enough. Cassie, where are you at? I'm going to give it Four and a half pikes with a mermaid on a torpedo. Yes. Wow. <laughs> also, I really liked it. This is, again, I told you, this is one that I didn't read when I was younger. I think if I had, this would probably be one of my favorite ones too, because it had that same, like, like you said, that same sort of vibe as Whisper of Death. But this one was also dumber and more corny, which I like. So yeah. it, it felt fun, but also like desolate and like yeah. scary. Um, yeah. And there are some scenes in here that are just like the mountain and like the house and also why make it purple? Like what a random choice. Yeah, I love I it. Yeah, I, I love the it. purple like, thing. I know it, it sounds great, but it's random. Yeah. Like There's things just, just aren't purple. You just don't see purple. that. Yeah. 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 I love it. I love it. I'm here for it. So I, I really like this one. I thought this was, this is one of the the better ones that we've done so far. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to hassle Becca. Becca, when you listen to this, you got to read this book. And you got to give <laughs> tell us, us what you think yeah. of Ceci. Yes. Yes. So yes. I I was coming into this podcast with a four, but I'm moving to four and a half. Ooh. Because Ooh. as I talked about it, I realized how much I really enjoyed it. And like the wackiest of Pike, it is so odd that you just have to keep reading. Yes. Because you are desperate to find out what are the fucking lizard people doing? <laughs> well, that's why I think I'll definitely will read more because right now I'm reading as a distraction and as a mm -hmm. escapism. And I was like, I really enjoyed how ridiculous this was, how much I was like, I want to find out what the fuck is going on. And even though I was disappointed that it was lizard people, I still liked how they <laughs> did it as lizard people, if that makes sense. So like, oh, I might, I, you know what? I'm going to read Pia's mind to a four. I'm going to give it a four. Wow. Wow. <laughs> I'm going to give it four pikes. Because I enjoyed it. That, I had a fun time. I got to say, that actually puts it as number two Ooh. on our on our ranking list, uh, pending Becca's thoughts. So Ooh, right after Monster? Yeah. Right after Monster, which is yeah. which is our number one. It's a 4.875 monster. Oh. So uh, that's that's almost just five across the board. Yeah. So, yeah. I will. So I will warn you, JJ, though, because of part of what bothered you from this one, that one has a lot of the problematic, problematic stuff in the way that um, in the same way that they lend on like Native American stuff yeah. with it being older. So they didn't have proper terminology. And there were some characters that were not super great, but it's okay. Most of it is not that. So that is something that's in there. Um, and that's something we bring up on the episode, too. So if you ever listen to that one, you'll hear us because we we definitely bring it up in the problematic section. But just as a warning before you go Thank into you. it, because we're saying how good it is. Yeah, yeah. no problem. <laughs> I, I, do, I do appreciate that. Though. There like, there are problematic aspects of every Pike book we have read. They're from, you know, they're from an era. And like, 
it's it's irritating often when people are like, oh, it's from an era, but it's different when it's a piece of media versus like a person, you know, <laughs> like a person can change. This media is what it is. Yeah, exactly. agreed. So, OK, that brings us to the wrap up. Uh, so, JJ, thank you so much for joining us. Of course. And for for being willing to dive into a podcast about an author you'd never read before. Well, I mean, I, I figured well. either I'd hate it and I'd be a fun uh, dissenting <laughs> voice or uh-huh. I'd like it. But I, I, when I saw that the episodes were like two hours long, I'm like, oh, this will be fine. I'm very over analytical. This will be okay. <laughs> unlike, unlike some reviews, we we do appreciate the analytical element of this podcast. Yes, good. <laughs> so, AJ, where can our listeners find you online? Well, uh, I think the first thing we have to plug is the fact that I. I am the narrator for Cooper's book, As Good As Gone, um, and am working currently on the sequel. And is that still available on your website, Cooper, or is it just on Audible now? Uh, the the first one is just on Audible now. You can pre-order the second one on my website. But I want, I'm, Audible has this goofy-ass exclusivity thing, so I'm just trying uh, that for a little while. Well, so, tragically, hey, it's on Audible. So, if but, you yeah. don't have Audible... It's real easy to get the book for free then with a free trial. Ah, there you go. And I actually make more money if you get a free trial of Audible and make my book your first book. And then you don't even have to pay for it. And oh. I get more money. Well, there you go, y'all. Please There's do that no because it supports Cooper and me. Yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. So you can listen to more of my voice. I am a slightly less hyperactive i will only say slightly depends on which character i'm voicing uh and it is a wonderful book about a queer alcoholic uh trying to solve a supernatural mystery um if you like other spooky things i do have a podcast it is the after disaster broadcast not podcast that's a juggalo podcast their fans hate me uh (laughs) <laughs> it's a whole oh, long God. story but the after disaster broadcast if you find one with a volcano and a, a ham radio uh, microphone on it that's the right one um and it's about uh women and queers trying to survive the super volcano in yellowstone erupting um and it's basically about what uniquely would be the women and queers experience with like survival and the apocalypse it is a comedy but it's dark. <laughs> so if you're not feeling like that right now and season two, we start talking about disease. Uh, so yeah. if that's a little too close to home right now, that's OK. The first season's not about disease. So I'll put that out there. Um, but yeah, like I kind of don't blame people for not listening right now. You can also find me on Twitter at Saint of Snark. <laughs> uh big shock uh where i tweet a lot about how angry i am about politics sometimes i'm funny uh but it's a lot of politics um and i guess you can also find me on instagram i i don't really post that often on there but if you want to see my thirst traps you can see them there um am i anywhere else uh, I don't know. Hire me to voice your shit. <laughs> I have a nice yes, sexy voice. Yes. <laughs> She's an awesome narrator. So if you have a book that needs narration, uh, you should you should definitely look into JJ for that. Thank you. I'm I great. Do, I do want to shout out your bio on Instagram <laughs> because oh. I just noticed this yesterday. <laughs> Uh, and I thought it was just fantastic. I can't believe it hasn't gotten me deleted. <laughs> You're only allowed to jerk off to my picks if you've listened to the After Disaster broadcast. I think that's fair. I, I think have, that's fair. Uh, I have made someone follow through on that before. <laughs> <laughs> I basically bullied a guy into listening to the entirety of my podcast and told him he was allowed to jerk off for every five episodes he listened to. <laughs> You, and got I a, have you got proof. a good DS thing going there. Yep, basically. <laughs> so, 
So yeah, uh, that's where you can find me. If you want me to bully you on Instagram. <laughs> clearly, she's ready for it. She's here for that. I'm ready. <laughs> so, Cassie, where are you bullying people? I don't. I don't do a lot of bullying. No, honestly. You don't. Um, no. Um, but you can find me on my blog at letsgetgalactic.com. And then I have an Etsy store where I sell art and books and um, a lot of stuff. Um, it's etsy.com slash shop slash let's get galactic art. And then you can find me on social media. My Instagram and Twitter are the same for my personal accounts, which is at control alt Cassie, C-T-R-L-A-L-T-C-A-S-S-I-E. And then I also have a bookstagram account, which is at reading in a prism on Instagram. Ooh. And Cassie is a, a human rainbow. <laughs> so if you uh if you like things in rainbow form you really owe it to yourself to spend some time on her etsy page because uh, i was <laughs> going to ask what you sell on etsy because i am a perpetual retail uh therapy person <laughs> uh, jj i think you would love the planchette but, uh, oh yeah so i have um magnets and um keychains and then i also have like diy embroidery kits and mm. i released three books last year um they're one of them is a tarot journal one of them is a coloring book of horror authors and then one of them is a witchy self-love planner and activity book um <gasps> oh I love and then there's planners. just stickers and coasters and just i have a lot of stuff <laughs> there's a lot of things i keep branching out because i have too many hobbies creatively and well, like it, to do it is it is wild to me how often i see you releasing a new product <laughs> Just wait, because I have like five of them coming in just a couple days. Oh, my God. Yeah. So, listeners, I admire please support Cassie by, uh, <laughs> by, buying, by buying stuff from her Etsy store. Mm-hmm. And, buy uh, the you audiobook, can find... buy Etsy shit. That's what we're <laughs> yes, telling yes, you. Yes, or I will bully you on Instagram. <laughs> yes, we're going to send her after you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, it seems like I bully people on Twitter, but I try not to. Um. My Twitter feed is also extremely political, so if you don't like that, head over to Instagram. I'm Cooper <laughs> S. Beckett all over the place. CooperSBeckett.com is my website. You can get my books there. Um, also, I just started a, a new online presence called Beckett Arts for my photography and, and drawings. It's very uh, good. You can find that at Beckett Arts on Twitter and Instagram again. Uh, that is not as political. So, you know, you don't but have it's to. Hot. But it's hot. Yeah, I, it's sexy art. I got sexy art there. Yeah. I got a little. I was going to say, you should probably give them a warning so they don't go to it when they're that's like. That's true. That's true. NSFW. <laughs> don't NSFW. look at yeah. 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 <laughs> really, I'm not safe for work at all. So just don't. I'm don't uh, barely. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I have a boudoir section, but it's separate, and I make sure it's not on my front page because I'm scared people will get mad. <laughs> or they'll like it. Maybe they'll yeah, that's to a, see I mean, the I'm right like... breast coming out of the bo- boudoir yeah, thing. It, it all depends on the breast, Cassie, I guess. Well, yes. What breast it was. <laughs> <laughs> what a lovely top of the breast it was indeed. <laughs> Cassie, why don't you tell our listeners where they can find our show? Um, you can find us on pretty much all social media. We are at the Pike Cast. It's simple. It's one word. Um, we'd really love it if you'd share your Pike books with us and use the hashtag show us your Pike. That way we can see them and retweet them or share them to our stories on Instagram. We also have a Patreon and you can find that at patreon.com slash the Pike Cast. And that goes toward helping us stay afloat cost wise with the podcast, with transcribing. Um, we have some merch, we have behind the scenes things, and we have early access to episodes. So definitely come check it out and hang out with us in our discord. We'd like to give a special shout out to our new patrons. Thank you to Tom, Norma, and Nicola. Thank you, Cassie. Your homework listeners for next time is an early one. 1986's The Tachyon Web. And uh, I've never read this one. I'm very excited on that. So we will see you next time on the Pikecast. Thank you, JJ, again. And pleasant dreams. Bye. Bye. (laughs) You survived the night, friends. You can peek out from under your covers and see the first blues of dawn out the window. Thanks for spending the night with the Pikecast, and we hope you'll join us again next time. Until then, Pikers, pleasant dreams.